Good morning, my name is Dominic Passage and you're watching BF24 live on the Munich Security Conference 2023. It is day two of this year's Munich Security Conference and the MSC is a platform for high-level debates on key security and foreign policy challenges of our time. We are covering the most interesting speeches, discussions and spotlights and we will provide you with all the info you need. Today there will be, among others, the Vice President of the United States speaking, Kamala Harris. But we will start with a panel discussion defending the UN Charter and Rules-Based International Order hosted by this year's Chairman of the Munich Security Conference, Christoph Heusken. And this will start in just an instant, so just Sit back and stay tuned. You're watching BR24 Live.
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats now. We're about to begin with the program. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, Ambassador Christoph Heusken. Good morning, good morning everybody. Um, good to see you here. We are starting half an hour early in comparison to other programs, so those who have been uh, um, going to Munich nightlife haven't made it yet um, back into the room, but um, they will come a bit later. But the first session this morning is one that is very um, dear to my heart, but uh, independent of uh, my own um, views on how important the relationship with the Global South is. This is um, one of the main themes of this year's Munich Security Conference. When we, when we see how the international rules-based order, the UN Charter, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is under, are under attack, we have to, to see how do, how do we defend it. And uh, of course we can try to do that in our closed um, European or transatlantic circle, but we'll see that we won't have majorities for that. And uh, we have to go beyond, we have to um, leave what also for the Munich Security Conference for many years was um, the, the core substance, this is transatlantic uh, relationship actually where 59 years ago the Munich Security Conference started. So what is for us very important at Munich is that we uh, enlarge the family, the enlarged the Munich Security Co um, Conference family, we have um, the largest number of uh, representatives from Latin America, Africa and Asia ever here at the Munich Security Conference. And uh, this panel today on the Saturday is for me um, the most important of all panels that we have during the three days. And um, I'm very happy that we have representatives from all um, three continents here. Um, and I would like to invite now to the podium the um, Vice President of uh, Colombia, um, and uh, Francia Marquez, please. The uh, Secretary of um, Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, Enrique Manalo. <laughs> the Prime Minister of Namibia, whose name I'm not going to pronounce correctly, Sara Kungogelva Amadila. <laughs> and the Foreign Minister of Brazil, Mauro Vieira. So welcome, welcome to um, the Munich Security Conference and to this podium. Um, we will start with a short round of um, um, 
discussions, ask you some questions, you respond, and uh, the shorter you are, if I may say so, the more questions we get in. And then we turn to the public um, so that um, also um, those um, in the room can ask you some questions. And I would like to start with um, Francia Marquez. Um, it was um, when, um, through your um, wonderful ambassador in Berlin, I learned uh, about you and, and your background. I said, we have to have her at Munich. Colombia, I must say, has been a very close friend um, to the Munich Security Conference. Also, in my time when I was um, foreign policy advisor to the Chancellor, we visited your country. We have, and I've seen in your former President Santos is here. He was defense minister in the 2000s, um, and I already met him at that time. He became president. He won the Nobel Prize. He did, a, um, I think, a fantastic, um, um, he played a fantastic role in your, in your country. Now, when um, um, we are here um, in this room, yesterday we have been discussing um, between Europeans, Europeans and Americans, um, we have been discussing and we have been preoccupied with Russia's war in Ukraine, its, its effect on, on Europe and beyond. But um, we um, sometimes, when we are so um, fixed, focused on, on this conflict, we forget about um, where, how the situation in other countries are. Now, if I can ask you, Vice President, what are currently the greatest um, concerns in, in your country? What does also Colombia then expect from its European and, and American partners? Muchas gracias. Saludo a todos los presentes. I'd like to greet everybody here in the room. First of all, I would like to say is what Colombia and what Latin America expects is sustainable peace, global peace. In my country, there has been a lot of blood because of a 60-year-old conflict. And we have significantly advanced resolving the conflict between the Colombian state and the FARC. But there are still other conflicts to solve. The total peace, the sustainable peace, is one of our goals. This means resolving our armed conflict with all the actors that put in risk uh, our lives. But sustainable peace also means social justice, close the gap of inequality and inequity. That's our goal. And of course, climate change is also impacting our country. So what we expect from Europe, what we expect from the world, is that we assume climate justice, and this implies energy transition. It's not enough to just receive financial means from Europe and Colombia. It is important that the world really tackles the climate crisis and the challenges. Because our country is not one of the countries that emits CO2 emissions, but we are in a region where we have to deal with the losses, the damages, the consequences of the climate crisis. Today in Latin America, in Brazil, in Colombia, we are trying to protect the Amazon rainforest that is the lung of the world and that keeps up the balance. So this is one of the challenges uh, we are tackling in our government. We are an alternative government. We are a grassroots government. And we are calling on the world to assume a new international world order that places life in the middle of everything, that protects life. We don't want to go on discussing on who will be the winner or the loser of a war. We are all losers. And uh, in the end, it's humankind who, that loses everything. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this. Um, what um, 
yesterday also I briefly mentioned in my opening speech was the fact that this um, attack by Putin, by Russia on Ukraine now absorbs enormous amounts of money for um, the defense of, of Ukraine, billions, and uh, um, these would be much better spent on what you said about damage, on, on the fund of loss and damage, and so that we can support it. Can I ask you briefly, um, one of the issues we are also discussing here is how to prevent um, impunity for crimes committed, um, and we are um, tackling this very challenging instrument. You have been a front runner on this, and you have had your um, um, you have been working fighting against impunity with a. I think President Santos was responsible also for this um, fight uh, against impunity, and you have the Truth um, Commission's um, final report that came out. What is your um, at the end now, what is your view of how this has worked in Colombia? Had this given satisfaction to the victims of um, uh, the violence that um, was in your country for so many years? Well, I don't think um, it will be possible to get a satisfactory solution after a war. Violence and war can never be satisfactory. On the contrary, my country, our society, is broken after so many years of suffering. Every single family in Colombia has lost in this war we have suffered. Every village, every territory has been affected. So I think we need to turn the page, not just to damn this generation to more suffering. We need to, um, to get new conditions for the new generations, for our um, children, for our grandchildren, who don't deserve suffering like that. I am 41 years old, and half of my life I have spent in this armed conflict. We have, have, we have had millions of victims. So we need to um, make all we can for peace. And the most important topic which needs to be on the table are the victims. So victims have been a part of this dialogue um, for these peace conversations. And we need to allow these victims to live in peace. We do not want them to suffer anymore what we have been suffering. And this doesn't mean impunity. On the contrary, I believe we need to find a way to exit a conflict a different way, because war hasn't led to an exit. We have only had misery, hunger, impoverishment. So we need to fight for peace. We need to close gaps of inequality, of inequity. We need to protect nature. We need to protect society. and change our development system so, that's, so that the wealth doesn't concentrate just on a few people. We have mechanisms after this peace process of the Commission for the Truth. We have a, a commission which will be tackled with um, judging crimes committed. This is an example not only for Colombia, but for the whole world. The important thing is that we are able to reconcile. It's important that we are able to turn the page and advance. No, thank you very much. We don't have the time to dwell on this, but I think these remarks are very, very important that you have a victim-centered approach and uh, you have to 
try to have this reconciliation. Now, let me turn to the Secretary of Foreign Affairs of the Philippines, Enrique Manalo. I'm very, very happy to have you here because you belong to the family of former UN ambassadors. And uh, of course, uh, this is, uh, you have a privileged status here now, um, as long as I'm the chairman here. And, uh, um, but I wanted to ask you, um, this is a disadvantage, um, that I go directly into the middle of the the, the, the real problems that we are facing and um, um, we had invited you and um, uh, we are of course then following events in Philippines and we were all of course uh, concerned uh, when um, we saw that um, uh, this earlier this week a Chinese Coast Guard vessel pointed a military grade green laser light at the Philippines Coast Guard ship. This was an event that, um, of course, made the headlines, and um, like to for you to to maybe um, uh, comment on this, on your relationship also with China in the South China Sea, what is still looming, of course, and um, where we still wait. How, how is it going to be implemented? Is um, what um, was uh, decided by the um, um, arbitrary court of the Internet Law of the Sea in 2000, I think, uh, 16 on the Scarborough Reef, and uh, where China was actually um, uh, condemned, and it was said that what China had been doing there was not in conformity with international law. How do you deal with this in an area? Um, um, where there are um, also neighbors having also similar conflict. How do you deal with this? How do you, how, uh, and how do we, can we help also? Because I said at the very beginning, what is the objective is to have the rules-based international order implemented. Well, thank you very much and a great pleasure to be here. And uh, I think you've given me a a fairly uh, complex question, which I'll try and answer in about five minutes, but I'm pretty sure uh, after five minutes you'll have a great idea of how the situation is. But uh, let me uh, preface whatever I say by, by just giving a very uh, broad um, picture. Uh, of course, all of us are aware of the sharpening U.S.-China rivalry, not only in Asia, but of course across the world. And as an archipelagic nation, uh, the Philippines has always advocated a rules-based maritime order uh, based on the convention, the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea, and also uh, in terms of the uh, resoundingly uh, victorious 2016 arbitral award against China, which uh, uh, in effect uh, uh, vindicated our contention that the, um, the nine-dash line, which China claimed in the South China Sea, was inconsistent with the UNCLOS. So this arbitral award basically um, uh, provides a mooring, for, for, at least as far as we're concerned, for the maritime regime in the South China Sea, especially because it's, it's, um, it's based on the UNCLOS. And moreover, this uh, arbitral award has been supported by quite a number of countries in the uh, international community, and uh, because I think they also feel that it, sh uh, it is consistent with having a rules-based regional architecture, uh, especially in, in, insofar as a maritime domain. So we have held uh, to this position consistently, and we will continue to do so. Now, of course, uh, in the, uh, at the same time, we're also working on a code of conduct on the South China Sea, and this involves ASEAN and China. So this is the situation, but uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, there are still many events occurring in the South China Sea. And uh, there are daily incidents, at least as far as we see it, of uh, cases of harassment or, or land reclamation, which in many cases have been uh, depriving the Philippines of the use of our exclusive economic zone. And uh, one of the uh, uh, main uh, results of this uh, arbitration case was that it, it uh, clearly stated that the Chinese uh, claim of a nine-dash line in the South China Sea is inconsistent with UNCLOS. And so we're abiding by that. So it is these challenges which the Philippines and other countries in our region face, uh, especially those with claims also in the South China Sea. So I think that is more or less the, um, the daily situation that we face. And uh, our, our hope is that the international community 
uh, in the context of affirming the need for a rules-based order would understand our position and help us uh, and support not only the Philippines but other countries in ensuring that we have uh, adherence to a rules-based uh, order in the, uh, in the South China Sea. Yeah, well, this is the rules-based order, and um, one has to try to get it implemented. When we were when uh, Germany was on the when Germany was sitting on the Security Council, we had similar incidents, and uh, also then there were some attack on on fishery vessels, and um, um, there was um, ASEAN colleagues sitting on the Security Council at the time and uh, asked him, well, this is an attack on, on peace and security. Why don't you table it in the Security Council, um, which is the, the, the place to do it? And he said, well, you know, we have so important trade relations, therefore, you know, we, we don't want to put it there. So if we want to defend the rules-based order, we also have to make a case of it. Or, or what, what is your view? How can we then implement in this area the, the rules-based order? Well, uh, it might be difficult in the Security Council for practical reasons uh, if we look at the membership. But uh, <clears throat> what I can say is that uh, it, it need, I mean, there is, uh, we need not have, uh, for example, uh, necessarily immediately decisions by the Council, but there can be open debates on this issue and to create greater awareness of the issue, as well as uh, not only the Security Council, but in the General Assembly. Uh, but let me just also say that we have this issue as, uh, on the South China Sea with China, but at the same time, we've also agreed with China that this, this issue is not going to be the sum total of our relationship with China. You know, it's a very complex situation. The Philippines and China and other countries in the region have very strong links with China on the economic and cultural front. So that creates uh, greater, uh, more complexity to the situation. But in, in terms of this particular issue, uh, the UN could have a role uh, in the sense of bringing this issue to the fore in, in discussions and debates. And perhaps the Council could have a debate, maybe not necessarily directly on, let's say, the arbitral award, but on rule and order, for example, or rule and order to prevail in the maritime domain in the South China Sea, and to talk about UNCLOS. And I think discussions like that would help create greater awareness of the importance of UNCLOS and also um, of, of maintaining a rules-based order so that any disputes or conflicts are, are settled through the rule of law and through peaceful means and not through, uh, not through coercive measures or, or aggressive uh, moves. Yes, so um, President Ilves, just take a seat. <laughs> just take a seat. <laughs> um, so um, I think this is kind of a um, demand you know, for actually also our colleagues or our successors at the UN just to pick it up and maybe you know, just have an open debate. So uh, I take this as an operational uh, proposal from you um, to those who listen. Um, now, it's my great pleasure um, to have the Prime Minister of Namibia here. Thank you so much for coming. I know that in, um, uh, we have a bit of a competition here at the Munich Security Conference. That is that in parallel, the um, summit of the African Union is meeting in, um, in Addis. And we are very happy that instead of going to Addis, you have come to, um, you have come to Munich. So thank you very much um, for, for this. Um, now, at, the, um, um, at COP27, the EU and uh, Namibia um, concluded a strategic partnership um, on um, sustainable raw materials and uh, renewable hydrogen. Um, we have, uh, Germany has signed this partnership with Namibia. Um, now, on, on climate change, on um, um, working um, to to remedy situation, and we saw, we heard what the pre, uh, what the vice president of Colombia also said on climate change. This relationship that um, we are developing um, as EU and as um, Germany with Namibia um, is this something that um, you say this is kind of a exemplary for also other countries because it ensures. Um, mutual benefits, um, local <coughs> value addition, align climate and development goals. So do you see that this is something that you could recommend also to other countries to conclude? Yes, thank you very much. Um, 
it is an agreement that is very important, I must say, for, for Namibia. As I can see, it is for Germany and, and for Europe uh, generally. Uh, one, for Namibia, because we are one of the countries that are most affected by climate change, and we experience all sorts of climate-related disasters. As I am speaking, there are parts of my country that are flooded, and there are parts of the country that have suffered from drought. So we are providing relief to communities that have suffered from drought and others that have suffered from, from flooding. So for us, really uh, generating energy through climate-friendly means is, is very important for us. Uh, and, and green hydrogen, therefore, is a very strategic project for us. Um, it is our wish, and we are happy that Germany and our other partners in this project are embracing of this idea that this project uh, turns out to be mutually beneficial to, to both countries. Because what we have observed is that the southern uh, countries that are endowed with resources are often benefiting only marginally or not at all from the resources that uh, they are endowed with. And in order for us to ensure sustainable cooperation between our countries that would promote um, mutual benefits, we have to ensure that these projects are implemented in a manner that they benefit both countries. Uh, of course, Germany has technology, Germany has skills, and we would like that this project would not only provide energy to Europe, uh, it would provide energy also to Namibia, also to SADAC. It would address the issue of security of supply of energy and also the cost of energy, and that it would support the development of the entire value chain so that there is also an improvement on the economy of the situation, improvement in terms of uh, forex earnings, public revenue, job creation, and reduction of a uh, inequities and industrialization. So we are hopeful that these, these goals are going to be realized. And to the extent that that is so, obviously, we would like that to be a model of, of cooperation between the North and the South. No, thank you for this. Um, um, we have at the conference, I don't think he is here right now, the German Minister for um, Economy and, and the Environment, um, Mr. Habeck. He was in your country and um, um, also accompanied by industry, by business, because this is a corporation which you need. You need a government initiatives and government driven, but you need business to do it. So I really hope that the model that you just um, uh, said and you, you confirmed what I said earlier, we really hope to see that this works fast and uh, we'll have a look at this and maybe you know, in a year, a couple of years when you're here again, we see how it, how it worked out and if this, because we need to make progress. now. Um, you, will, you will probably ask why um, there are two Latin Americans and one African and um, um, uh, one Asian here. This has to do with Mauro. Mauro, the foreign minister of Brazil, is a very good friend. Um, and um, uh, we were uh, for three years together in, in uh, New York as UN ambassadors. And um, so um, when also your wonderful ambassador um, incited me to say, well, Mauro has to be on this forum, and I said, OK, I'll ask our two other uh, from the other country for their uh, understanding that Mauro is al also here. And I would like to um, continue um, with the theme. Um, when your president and um, uh, President Lula, in his first speech uh, to the nation, said, I quote, Brazil would resume uh, its leading role in the fight against the climate crisis. I think the, the whole world was uh, relieved and, and was very happy about what your president uh, said. Maybe, uh, Mauro, you can tell us a bit what priorities does the government set in achieving this ambition and um, how can global climate action um, be be advanced with um, Brazilian leadership. Mauro, again, thanks so much for coming. Well, thank you so much, Christoph, for inviting me. It's really a pleasure to be here and to see so many uh, friendly faces from the New York Times. And I really enjoyed very much working with you during the three years we had together there. Well, uh, 
with reference to uh, the, the environment policy that was presented by President Lula, as a matter of fact, he launched his platform of climate change and uh, the fight against climate change and environment at the COP27 in Sharm el Sheikh, Egypt. He went there as a guest. He was president elect, but he delivered a very powerful speech where he set the basis for his whole policy concerning environment and climate change and so on. And he stated it clearly and he repeated it in his uh, inauguration speech that climate change and environment will be a main concern and a pillar of for foreign and domestic policy. Well, uh, the goal, one of his goals is to uh, zero deforest deforestation by 2028, which is a big challenge, but the government is ready to that. We have the, the, the instruments and the skill, the knowledge to continue to fight, reversing the previous uh, policies. And uh, he also stated that he wants to recover, to restore 18 million hectares of land of, that, were, that was taken from the forests in different areas. So those are two very big and very important goals. And uh, as was said before in this panel, we also suffer from droughts and from floods in other regions, but we have the chance to have the Amazon. 60% of the Amazon forest is in, the, in Brazil. And the president has said that uh, the, the, the eight countries in the north of South America are, have the sovereignty over Amazon, but we, want, we understand the importance of the Amazon forest to the world, to us, South Americans, and to the world. And we want to uh, preserve it for the good of the planet. The planet has shown so many signs of decay, of crisis, and uh, big impact. So uh, he also wants to have the cooperation of, of uh, developed countries. And in exchanging um, knowledge, exchanging uh, scientific knowledge and also in financing. It's very important and we were very glad that uh, many European countries, Germany was the first announced that uh, Germany would come back to the Amazon fund which was established uh, in the first term of President Lula with a view to finance projects of sustainability and development in the region, in Brazil and the neighboring countries. And other countries followed. Uh, it's uh, like um, Norway and France, the United States, uh, they have uh, also declared that they would take part in the Amazon fund. It's very important to have a funding for projects of sustainability in the area. <laughs> and, well, besides that, President Lula wants to host uh, COP30 in 2025 in Brazil, in the Amazon. It will take place at the state of Pará, in the north of Brazil, in the heart of the Amazon. He wants to showcase the Amazon and what we'll be doing from here till 2025. And besides that, we will also in, in, in order to make it public that we want to have uh, uh, environment and protection of the forest in the center of our policies, he will uh, summon uh, a summit of uh, presidents of the Amazon region. The treaty, we have an organization, OTCA, Organization of the Treaty of Cooperation in the Amazon, and he is in the month of August, he wants to host this uh, summit in Brazil and to take the results of this summit and present them at UN at the opening of the General Assembly. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, the whole world is watching because Brazil, uh, Brazil plays such an important role in this and uh, we wish you good luck and um, I think it's very 
important with regard to the fund in general that the international community stands together in supporting the project. Now, um, I turn to the audience. Um, this is now um, an opportunity to um, ask uh, questions, to make comments. Um, um, and when you do that, please identify yourself. Um, um, if I don't have, can just ask while people are thinking, Mauro, one last one question to you still. When we were working together in, um, in New York, we of course discussed a lot about football, um, but at the same time we sat together in our group of G4 with our friends from India and Japan and we were trying to push reform of the Security Council. Now, I don't know how your assessment was after we had about, I don't know, 50, 60 meetings when you and I left, um, what your assessment was about the progress we had achieved during this time. Um, but in general, um, when you now look back to your time there and as foreign minister, you have, of course, opportunities to impact um, the UN reform. Um, how optimistic are you that we'll succeed in um, preserving the UN Charter um, as a guardian of um, you know, the um, international uh, cooperation and life together on this planet and uh, can, is there a chance to strengthen this um, by, um, by changing the, the Charter with regard to the composition of um, um, the Security Council? Is there any hope or, um, but please a short answer because on this topic one can talk for an hour. <laughs> yes, no doubt or maybe much longer as we did in New York during three and a half years. And Christian Venavez is here, he's a witness of the effort we had. No, uh, we continue to, uh, to work uh, very intensely with the uh, reform of Security Council, but not only the Security Council. The UN needs to uh, review the, the methods of work of the General Assembly, the Security Council, the composition, and so on. And we need to have more representation. It has to be more legitimate uh, with more representation. There are at least two continents that are totally absent in the Security Council. And uh, we, uh, but it's not, as I said, the only one. I think that we have to, to think in terms of uh, uh, global uh, uh, institutions that, that can help us keep peace and govern the world. Uh, global governance. Uh, WTO is another example. Example, uh, World Trade Organization is totally paralyzed and it's a very important tool to promote trade development and also sustainability and peace. The Security Council, of course, it's the, 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 the best example. It's visible. We have to do something in the coming years, because otherwise we'll see um, UN being paralyzed as well as uh, other, other institutions. And I believe it's very paralyzed these days. Yeah, thank you for this. So um, we take Natalie Tocci first and then Javier Solana. Thank you very much. Now, over the course of the last few days and, and, and the next, um, inevitably much of the discussion has revolved around Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I think it would be extremely important for the Europeans and North Americans in this room to hear your take, uh, not so much on the war, but how the war endangers the international order, and in particular the priorities that you've been discussing on this panel uh, that affect your countries, from climate and, uh, and the transition to uh, maritime security, etc. You direct this to Mauro. Yes. The question is... Uh, yeah. To whoever yeah. wants to pick the song. So you have to pick one because if all four speak, nobody else will have a chance to. Uh, <laughs> so. Mauro. Yeah. Mauro. Okay. <laughs> well. Okay. Sorry to put you on the spot there. No. No. Well, thank you. Thank you for your question. Of course, the uh, the war in Ukraine is a very sad situation. We are living, going through it with. Um, uh, 
uh, impacts all over the world. Even for us, we are so far away from the theater of a war, but of course the, the increase in prices of energy, inflation, food stuff, everything and disruption of sea, uh, maritime traffic, it's of course it's a question of great uh, concern. We have deplored strongly the, the invasion and we have condemned the aggression uh, we couldn't have done it otherwise because we have as main uh, goals of our or main instruments of uh, foreign policy, we have a set of um, principles like international law, uh, non intervention in foreign countries, uh, human rights, rule of law. So we could not have done otherwise. But that said, I think it's more than time, it's one year now we have to try to build the possibility of a solution. We cannot keep on talking only of war. We have to try to discuss some kind of uh, solution, uh, some space to be, I do not, uh, I do not mean uh, immediate uh, negotiation, a peace, that would be perfect and the ideal, but I think we have to go step by step and trying to find an atmosphere that would lead us to some uh, kind of uh, understanding and negotiation. Otherwise, we'll be stuck in this position. One could continue on this issue, but um, um, it's, it is indeed one of the overarching issues here. But I want to go to Javier Solana. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. It has been a very interesting uh, exchange of views <coughs> among yourself. I wonder if, uh, in particular, Mauro can answer a, a question about the role that your country wants to have uh, on the uh, ge geographical organization. BRICS, for instance, uh, how do you feel the, the energy of President Lula? Do you think that uh, that is, has to be mobilized at this point in time in which we need the uh, regional organization to be more active? And the uh, second question, uh, how do you see Mercosur moving? You know, for many in this audience, Europeans, the relation between Mercosur and Europe is fundamental. And for that, it's fundamental that Mercosur begins to be a uh, really important uh, alliance. And, uh, the same to, the, to our lady from Africa, African Union. African Union has started a couple of years ago, three years ago, with a, a new energy. Is that energy going to be continued? I know you have problems in the, in the organization. But I think in this debate about the United Nations, the role of this regional organization is going to be fundamental. So you can say something about that, uh, I would be really appreciated. Thank you. To, to allow Mauro, who has been on the spot all the time, to breathe a bit, um, would you want to start on the role of the African Union? Prime Minister? Oh, is it myself? Okay. Yes, it's yourself. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, the African Union uh, is quite uh, optimistic or probably committed to drive the AU agenda that we call Agenda 2063, that aims to ensure that uh, there is human-centered development in Africa. And that goes back to the point that I made earlier in regard to the uh, green hydrogen project. Uh, the idea is to ensure that we do not only optimize economic growth in Africa, but that that growth is going to translate into improved uh, conditions of the people of Africa, that we would like to build the resilience of the African uh, economies, and uh, we want to achieve industrialization uh, of, of Africa, and uh, most importantly, to safeguard the peace and security in, in, in Africa. So that commitment remains, uh, and that is why there is an AU uh, summit that is taking place now. Our president is attending together with the a Minister of International Relations, who is the Deputy Prime Minister. Uh, it was Division of Labor that I'm here. 
Of course, we recognize that we would need to uh, pursue a partnership with uh, Europe, for example, amongst others, America and others that we trade with, and also that we work with on other matters around the world in order for, for that vision to be realized, because these regions are our trade partners and much of the goods that we produce now uh, end up in, in those markets. It is our hope that uh, our partnership would progress along the lines of optimizing benefits for both parties, as I have indicated in the case of green hydrogen. But it's also important that uh, we invest more resources as a global community and efforts to safeguard peace and security. And that would include that where there are conflicts, we find peaceful means of resolving those conflicts. Because obviously it is, it is distressing when there are conflicts because they cause human suffering. Uh, for those of us who come from countries like Namibia that were assisted by the Soviet Union, it's very sad to see Ukraine and Russia fighting because these two states were Soviet Union that supported us to gain our independence. So we, we are not promoting one against the other. We are not indifferent to the suffering of one or another. That is why we are promoting a peaceful resolution of that conflict so that the entire world and all the resources of the world can be focused on improving the conditions of people around the world instead of being spent on acquiring weapons, killing people, and actually creating hostilities that would take forever to, to overcome. So our position is that for as long as one person in this world feels insecure, for as long as one person feels shortchanged, that person will be angry, and that person is going to destroy the peace and security of everyone. So all of us are better off. That is what we were advised when we were fighting for our independence to do. That is what we eventually did. Our war for national liberation, which was very bloody and protracted, ended with a negotiated settlement. And today Namibia is hailed as one of the most peaceful, most stable countries in Africa. Those who may not be aware of the history that we went through would not know what we went through. We went through genocide. We went through a system where Africans were trophy hunted. We went through a situation where 80% of a whole tribe was wiped out. But we decided to put that behind us and look forward to the future. And that is now we are, why we are hopeful today that we can prosper together with countries that we consider to be enemies, but are today partners with whom we are working towards a prosperous future for all our countries. But allow me to ask you, Prime Minister, you just mentioned exactly what we are witnessing, that instead of focusing on the real problems, we have now you know, this conflict where so many lives um, um, are lost and so much money is spent. Um, instead of looking at these problems. And the General Assembly, very clearly, 141 condemned and made very clear who is the aggressor. And taking this, why did Namibia abstain? Yeah, you see, as I have indicated, our focus is on resolving the problem. It is not on shifting blame. And that is what we did in Namibia itself. We decided to adopt the policy of national reconciliation. Every country deals with issues differently. In South Africa, our neighbor, they had the Commission for Truth and Reconciliation, where those that are suspected of having committed transgressions during the apartheid period were called to give witness. And those who did not do that ended up going to jail. In Namibia, we decided to not do that. It doesn't mean that we were not hurt because of what happened to us. We thought that would work better for us, and it has worked better for us. We are saying that in this situation where Namibia itself has suffered, because we suffered disruption of supply chains, increase in prices, recession of the economy, erosion of the gains, the social gains that we had realized, and now really challenges in terms of meeting our development uh, goals. And that is now besides the human sufferings that we are not indifferent to. We are saying, however, it doesn't really help us to spend money, be it Russia spending money on the uh, weapons or the Western countries arming Ukraine, the bottom line is that this money by Russia and the West that is used to buy weapons to enable Russia and Ukraine to kill one another could be better utilized 
to promote development in, in Ukraine, in Africa, in Asia, and other places, in Europe itself, where many people are experiencing hardships. That is really what we are saying. Let's engage one another and find a solution that is hopefully permanent so that we would never ever see the like or the situation like uh, what is now happening in Ukraine, which is unfortunately also happening in other parts of the world, including Palestine, Iraq, Yemen, and all these other trouble spots. I think we can, we will do better to try and resolve this conflict peacefully. Mauro, I come to you later because we are, we are, this was an important question. We are losing time and I'm about to lose some friends if I don't call on them. Minister Aide, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Christoph, and congratulations on an excellent panel. I think it's uh, imperative that we listen to the voices of the South in this meeting, so congrats on that. And my question is to Vice President uh, Marcus and uh, Foreign Minister Vero. Um, Norway, where I come from, have a very solid cooperation with both of you on preserving the Amazon, which, by the way, is not only a regional issue, but it's a global issue. We can simply forget about everything we do in uh, climate change uh, policies if we lose the rainforest, so that's essential. Could you reflect a little bit on your own cooperation with the neighboring countries, the eight countries of the Amazon, and also this idea that President Lula has been mentioning about sort of a South-South cooperation across the rainforest belt with the Congo Basin, Indonesia, and yourself, how that's going, and how you know, the geopolitics of nature preservation is now coming up on the agenda with this very positive development in Latin America. Can I put this just to the Vice President of Colombia? Yes. The exact question? Well, I believe that we uh, want to have a fund in order to protect the Amazons because it's the um, the place where the balance can be kept to fight climate change. I come from a different region of Colombia, uh, from the coast, and the the sea is also key in order to keep the balance uh, to fight climate change. We are here in order to speak about security, and we. When we speak about security, we need to ask ourselves, what are the reasons that make us feel insecure? There's a, a big part of the world feeling insecure. And we need to reflect about this more deeply. I agree um, about what the prime minister said that we cannot solve insecurity with weapons. We need to find different ways. These old rules of militarization of life, which we have been witnessing until now, doesn't fit anymore um, the needs we have today. It's anachronistic. And climate change is one of the biggest issues. We had to bury a lot of people this year in my country who died due to floodings and to droughts um, caused by climate change in our country. So we have huge challenges. Also hunger. In my country, there are still children dying of hunger every day. Starvation is still a problem. And this has to do with the um, development model, which is not addressing human needs currently. We also have a migration crisis. In Colombia, we are welcoming a lot of refugees from other countries, but also people from our country are um, going to are going abroad in order to find uh, better life conditions. And the same goes for people fleeing from Africa or from elsewhere to Europe. 
and they don't find good conditions here. They don't have a dignity in their life here. So that's why I think the new world order has to place humanity uh, at its center and not militarization. So it's not about um, taking a, a position about this war, be it Russia, be it Ukraine. We are against war because war has always destroyed humanity. We have had that violence in our country. We had to bury social leaders every day. We have seen how children were recruited by armed groups. And what use would be contributing to keeping up another war? I believe nowadays bilateral relations and diplomacy is not able to address the real challenges humanity is facing. I think we need to go beyond and reflect about the real challenges we have as a society. We are pursuing what we call total peace. We want to achieve real peace in Colombia, which will contribute to a bigger stability in Latin America. At and it will contribute to a better protection of the um, Amazon, which will in turn contribute to stability in the whole world. Also, food sovereignty, which is usually not discussed in these conferences, is very important. We need to contribute to the development of food sovereignty. And it needs to be sustainable. It needs to be ecologic. I am a woman. I am the first person of African descent getting uh, to, to the vice presidency of my country. And we need and that women get more power also in bilateral relations because until now it was usually men in power who always kept wars going on. And it's not about a fight between men and women here, but I do believe that women need to play a more central role because Whenever there is a war or any violent situation, women are affected the most. And in the end, after the war, we are the ones um, having to pick up the ashes and start reconstruction. Who reconstructed Germany after the war? It was the women. Who was it in Africa after each war? The same in Latin America. Societies are always reconstructed by women. So I think the time has come for men to accept the need of doing away with this patriarchy, with these rules, so that we achieve a new world order which does away with patriarchy, with racism, and with this colonialism we still witness, I believe the current situation forces us to reflect about this. It's not just about receiving a bit of money from the North. In the end, climate change will affect us all. And we need to tackle the challenges we have as humankind. And it's not about to decide what side um, I'm on um, when we talk about a war. We need to put all our efforts in order to create a different world with more respect for each other, with more respect for diversity, 
a world in which we all conceive us all as one society with transparency, transparency with a um, lot of honesty, and we need to advance more with regards to protection of life. And since we are discussing security here, this is what I want to put on the table. We usually think of security from a very manly point of view, and we need to protect Thank you. Thank you, Vice President, for this statement. Um, you run, as we say in German, into you run into open doors here. We at the Munich Security Conference are committed on the podiums to have 50% women. And now as a male, I have to see that I leave this room because I give the floor now to a podium of two women. Um, but before this, thank you, <laughs> for, thank you for, for being here. Thank you for your strong statement. But allow me this one remark um, on uh, what you said. My country, Germany, um, was responsible for the Second World War. In our name, um, 20 million people were killed um, on the territory of the former Soviet Union. Um, Germany tried with reconciliation West and East um, to actually achieve what you want to, um, peace for humanity, peace in Europe. We have actually scaled down our military forces. We have scaled down our, our budget um, for, for military, very low. Um, and um, we really try to say, well, we are surrounded only by peaceful neighbors. Why do we need an army, basically? But then you are confronted with a person, with a country that decides that it's not happy to live on the basis of common rules, that decides just to run over another country, to um, deny the um, right of existence of another country. <coughs> and in this case, um, I'm very sorry to say this, Vice President, um, from a German perspective, who have learned the, um, uh, the, 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 the lessons of history, we cannot sit on the fence, because what we want to is preserve humanity, and what is being destroyed by Russia in Ukraine is humanity. So thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for, for coming. I really appreciate this. As I said at the outset, for me, this was the most important panel um, of the Munich Security Conference because we want to do exactly what you said, Vice President. We want to take these serious the concerns you are, and we have to stick together. So thank you for coming. Ladies and gentlemen. Coming up next, the panel discussion more than the sum of its parts, the birth of geopolitical Europe with the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and Sanna Marin, Finland's prime minister. You're watching BR24 live on the Munich Security Conference. I kindly ask you to remain seated as the program will continue momentarily. <laughs>
Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask you to take your seats as we're preparing for the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats now so we can prepare the room for the next session. Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask you to take your seats now as we have to continue the program in the main conference hall. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats now. Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask you to take your seats now so we can continue with the program. Sit down. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chief international anchor of CNN, Christian Amonpour. Hi, guys. Nice to be here. Would you mind all taking your seats? Could we all take our seats? Yeah, let's all take our seats and we can start this powerhouse panel of women. We are the 50%. All right. And just one request, please, that you don't walk around during because this is a beautiful uh, set of cameras and angles and we don't want these ladies obscured by people's heads. Right. I think we're ready. All right. May I please welcome yeah. Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, and Sana Marin, Prime Minister of Finland. Welcome. <laughs> Can I just start by putting it in context and asking a little bit of an atmospheric question? You both assumed office, were elected to your positions in December of 2019. Shortly thereafter, the world changed. We first had the COVID uh, pandemic. Ursula von der Leyen, and both of you actually, did you ever imagine that you would be involved, and we're just talking about COVID now, in such a global upheaval when you first took the job? Of course not. I had no clue of what was coming up. Um, indeed, I came into office in December 2019. Yeah. So I had 90 days, and then the WHO declared the COVID as a global pandemic with all the consequences behind it. Um, we started actually, I started my mandate with one big priority and that is the European Green Deal and digitalization. In hindsight, it's still the big topic behind all these crises. But of course, then you have to deal with the pandemic. You have to deal with an atrocious Russian war in Ukraine. So we do not change the uh, direction of travel. But the speed and the challenges, of course, I had no clue what was coming up. And Prime Minister, you, you came into office also in December 2019, as the youngest Prime Minister in the world at the time. Yes. Uh, I'm not sure, though, am I still the youngest Prime Minister? <laughs> uh, Sebastian Kurz yes. uh, was a 
some, some part uh, of, of this uh, term, a prime minister, and a bit younger than me, and actually I just visited Austria yesterday, and, and I can remember the good cooperation that, that we had. Um, I must say that we didn't know what was happening uh, 2020, 2021, 2022, and the world isn't a very pretty place when looking back and looking at present and also, unfortunately, looking to the future. The first, the global pandemic hit and it changed our security environment in many ways and we had to make decisions that we thought that we could not do, but we had to do those. Um, then the war in Europe, energy crisis, and we are still uh, in the midst of war. Uh, and in the future, we are still heading towards our biggest challenges, climate change, loss of biodiversity. And as Ursula said, uh, we have to tackle these problems together. And if you may, Ursula, I want to give a little praise uh, to you. I cannot imagine better president for the EU Commission during these difficult, difficult times. Ursula has been real power player. And it's been an honor to work with you. Thank you. Thank you. Can I ask you something? I'm going to jump off from the last intervention in the previous panel, which I suppose one can call Global South. And Ambassador, when he opened this, uh, this conference, said one of the huge challenges, not just for the conference, but for the world and for policy, is to get a much wider public consensus around the world. You heard the Vice President of Colombia uh, essentially questioning the direction of flow. And I just wonder whether you think that the inability to create equality and equity during the pandemic, that the Global South felt totally cut off, that they didn't get the vaccines in the same way that the rich North did. I wonder if you both look back at that, despite your efforts, and wonder whether that might have contributed inter alia to some of the lack of support you have around the world for your Ukraine policy. I think, should I start, my dear? Yeah. <laughs> I think um, it is important that we're very clear about what this Russian war is. Uh, it is about Putin's imperialistic plans. And this is something where all of us, and uh, mainly the Global South, have a very clear idea. It is completely unacceptable. Mm -hmm. um, and countries um, on the other side of the Mediterranean have a bitter and long-standing experience. First, you send your negotiators in. Then you send. The, they see that the experts are sending, being sent in. And then it's the mercenaries that are being sent in. So what we have to do is not only explain that we will never ever accept this imperialistic war, we will never ever accept that um, Putin is trampling on the international law that protects all of us, um, that the UN Charter that is also in the interest, I mean it's in the interest of every single country, is uh, being treated so disrespectful, and that we will never accept that today you can send tanks just across the border to invade a country. And this is something which my experience in the last 12 months needs a lot of just hard work to work together with, as you said, the Global South um, to make understood our point of view, but also to work with them on dealing with the knock-on effect of this atrocious war. This is the food crisis. This is the energy crisis. And that we do our utmost to, um, to, to deal with the knock-on effects in a way that the Global South does not suffer too much um, from Putin's war of aggression. This is our task. It's hard work, uh, but it's absolutely worth it. Mm -hmm. Prime Minister Marin, somebody as cult a hero around the world as President Lula of Brazil also doesn't believe in the intervention that you all have taken in NATO. Uh, against, as you described, the illegal invasion of one country by an, a, a bigger country. So, as Commissioner von der Leyen says, we will never support this. We understand their historic issues. How do you see trying to convince others of the justness of your cause? The war in Ukraine, it's not only an issue for Europe. It's the issue for the whole world. And that's because there's a 
war of values going on. Authoritarian countries are raising their heads. They are uh, raising uh, their heads against the international rule-based order. And this is a problem for everyone. When uh, Russia attacked Ukraine, uh, it, it uh, violated all the, the rules, all the agreements it has itself mm -hmm. uh, been committed to before. Uh, and this is a problem for everyone, because then we will only see decades of this kind of behavior ahead of us if Ukraine uh, doesn't win the war and if we don't uh, stand behind our values and the international rule-based order. So I think uh, this is a larger uh, issue than just issue for Europe, just issue for, for Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And we have to do utmost to make sure that Ukraine will win and that we will preserve this uh, system of rules that we have created together. And there was a reason why this was created. The wars uh, before, world wars that we have seen, and it was devastating. And that's why we built a system where we can negotiate, where we can build peace, uh, not use uh, violence against each other, wars uh, attack another country uh, to make a stand or, or gain something. And to that end, when you came into office, you, I mean, as, as, as early as this time last year you were saying that Finland would not want to join NATO and then a month later was the invasion and now obviously you have joined you have, you're trying to join NATO there is a, a little bit of a kerfuffle with Turkey deciding whether it's going to approve or not we understood from the Secretary General of NATO that maybe now there will be separate tracks do you expect to join NATO separately or are you committed to trying to join it together with Sweden when the war, war started uh, 24 of February last year, and now we are heading towards a very sad uh, anniversary, one year anniversary of the war uh, just uh, next week, um, it was obvious that Finland will join NATO. It was obvious at the same day when uh, Russia attacked Ukraine. Uh, the Finnish mindset, uh, the most important thing for Finni Finnish people is to make sure that we are independent, we are secure, we have a sovereign country, we can make our own decisions. This is the number one uh, issue for Finnish people. And when Russia our neighbor attacked another neighbor, Ukraine, it was obvious that Finland will join NATO because that's the line, that's the only line that Russia wouldn't cross. So it's to do uh, with our security, it's to do with peace. It's an act of peace for Finland to join NATO. Uh, we have sent very clear message. We want to join together with Sweden at the same time. It's not only because we are good neighbors and good partners. It's all also to do with very uh, concrete matters. Uh, the security planning of NATO in in the whole north. It's in interest of us, but it's also in the interest of NATO that Finland and Sweden will join simultaneously. And we have sent very clear signal and very clear message uh, to Turkey and also to Hungary that hasn't ratified yet that we want to enter NATO together and this is in the interest of everyone. Mm -hmm. So no change then, even if some country no, wants no to change. hold No change. Of course we cannot influence and affect how some country would ratify. It's their decision. But our uh, message is that we are uh, willing to join and we prefer and want to join together. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> President von der Leyen, you remember very well this time last year there was warnings by the United States and, and the UK that Putin was planning an invasion your country, Germany, others, including the president of Ukraine who was sitting here, did not want to accept that that was a reality and basically were trying to say, no, we hope negotiation can work. Anyway, it didn't. But even then you were saying in your speech last year, and you, you used Ukraine as the cornerstone, you talked about Ukrainians as the new generation, young Ukrainians of Democrats around the world. Do you believe that this unity and steadfastness in the interim year will continue? Can you keep all your fractious members on board and people, 500 million people in the bloc? Absolutely. I'm today more convinced than I was a year ago. Um, but to set the record straight, um, indeed, our American friends, uh, way more than a year ago, uh, started to do something completely unprecedented, that they took their intelligence um, and what knowledge and put it on the public ma market. This gave us, gave us an early warning. And um, my cabinet and the commission started to work with the White House and with the Treasury already in December. 
on potential sanctions um, in case that Russia would invade Ukraine. Indeed, we all hoped that it would never happen and we would never have to use these sanctions, but it was a tedious work day and night to align our very different trade systems, to develop sanctions that are targeted at advanced technologies and goods that are irreplaceable for Russia, and to be completely synchronized um, also within the G7. This made it possible that on day two, day four, and day 10 of the invasion, we were able to put on the table very heavy sanction packages. Mm -hmm. So um, there was the early warning of the United States was helpful, and there was work being done without which we would not have been so effective. A second point is indeed, for me, really touching is the fact how Europeans, and I would say democracies, our friends, of course, and allies and partners, have immediately understood that this was serious and it is going to the core of our existence. Of course, we have many issues that we discuss. But here, from day one on, we were standing as one. We were united. We are united. And if you look back, I mean, through all the crises we have gone, including the energy crisis, and we have mastered it, uh, today I can really say I'm deeply convinced that uh, we will keep the unity and we will keep the determination because it's about our values and our very existence uh, we are fighting for. Looking back, uh, three steps. First, when the, when the war started, we were prepared and the Commission was prepared uh, making the sanctions together with all our allies and we were very fast of putting those sanctions on place. So we were prepared on that stage that way. Uh, but looking back, now it was obvious that Russia uh, will, at will attack. We didn't want to believe it. We tried everything that we uh, could to make a dip diplomatic solution, and that was, of course, the right effort to do, to trying to make a diplomatic solution. But looking back, it was obvious that Russia will uh, attack Ukraine. They already used the energy leverage uh, during that summer during that uh, autumn, uh, they already used the energy leverage. Uh, there was different kind of disruptions with the energy flows during that, that uh, year of, of 2021. Uh, they had uh, put their troops uh, in different places, saying that they are only training. Looking back now, it was obvious that they were planning this big attack uh, against Ukraine. And then looking way back uh, to 2014, uh, when the Crimea uh, was invaded, we made a big mistake then. We make a big mistake then together not to react more strongly. If we had acted uh, and reacted more strongly towards the Crimea, uh, then uh, the war wouldn't happen. I think Russia thought that it would be just like Crimea. Just entering Ukraine, Ukraine would give them uh, open welcome. It would last only for a few weeks and Putin would win uh, very, very quickly and easily the war because we didn't react to 2014. And now we have to learn some lessons on the current situation. And I think the main lesson is not to be naive. We cannot be naive. I listened to the, the previous panel and I agree. I also want the world which is beautiful and good and secure and we don't have to put money uh, to our military forces, to, to our uh, defense forces. I also want that world. But that world isn't a reality. The only way to secure peace, the only way to secure the international rule-based order is to make sure that Europe and democratic countries are strong, that we are investing in our defense capabilities, that we have that leverage and that we have also that threat uh, present that uh, these authoritarian countries, where Russia is, is a terrible uh, example, that they don't use force because they are also, and they have to think also twice, uh, will they use the force and what will be the consequences? Therefore, and this is the question, and we're trying to figure this out, what does winning look like to you all? You all have said very strongly what you've just said, Prime Minister. But what does winning look like? And in for a penny, in for a pound, surely. Surely you have to go to the very end, giving all the support that Ukraine needs to fight this war for them and for you. Is there, are you worried, 
ammunition production is not up and running like it should. There's some slowness, let's say, in, get in between requesting weapons and getting there. I know you've done an incredible job, but we're talking about an offensive. We're talking about a war that yesterday Chancellor Schultz said could go on for years, while Zelensky, the president, is saying he wants it ended this year. Don't you have to double, redouble, treble down on your efforts to end this in a victory. What, what does a victory look like? Nobody's defined it. Well, absolutely, we have to double down and we have to um, uh, continue the really massive support uh, that is necessary um, that this imperialistic plans of Putin will completely fail. This is one goal and that, um, that Ukraine is able to win. And what uh, the military support is concerned, indeed, I think it's now the time really to speed up uh, the production and to scale up the production of standardized products that Ukraine needs desperately. For example, the standardized, uh, standardized uh, ammunition. It cannot be that we have to wait months and years till we are able to replenish or till we are able to deliver that mm -hmm. to Ukraine. Um, what I thought is that we now take the European Peace Facility. It is in place. It is there to typically fund that member states give military equipment uh, to Ukraine. So it's an established body. It has a coordination mechanism with Ukraine. Um, and that we convene the uh, defense industry of Europe. And we very clearly ask them, what is it what you need to scale up and to speed up standardized project, products? I'm not uh, speaking about the highly complex production of specific uh, things, but the standardized products like 155 millimeters um, artillery, for example. So, um, and we need now uh, to do the same as we've done during the pandemic. There too, we've said, look to the pharmaceutical uh, companies. Yeah. What is it what you need to scale up? Mm -hmm. Um, we could think of, for example, advanced purchase agreements that gives the defense industry the possibility to invest in production lines now to be faster and to increase the amount they can deliver. Mm -hmm. And um, therefore, it is for us paramount uh, now to, to support Ukraine in these existential things. I think a second uh, element we should not underestimate is the economic security of Ukraine. Ukraine needs to survive economically. And there, um, it's good that we now have decided to have a regular budget support for Ukraine, 1.5 billion per month mm -hmm. by the European Union. Our American friends are matching that. And uh, I think the international financial institutions should, be, should do more for that also. Okay. So um, it is the time to step up because um, Ukraine really needs the material to survive. Well, what is a win for Ukraine? That's uh, the Ukrainians to decide. Our only job is to provide all the help that they need, uh, military help. Uh, I'm, I agree, fully agree uh, with, with President von der Leyen that we need to scale up and speed up the production of ammunition and, and other uh, military equipment uh, very fastly so that when we give uh, our uh, equipment, uh, our um, artillery to Ukraine, then we can also replace that and not be vulnerable uh, in the upcoming years. So I totally agree uh, with that. So we have to, of course, give them military aid and also much more uh, heavier mm -hmm. uh, weaponry uh, that they, they have already received. Uh, and we have to send a clear message that we will continue this as long as, it's take, as, long as it takes, as long as it's needed. Um, they need financial help, they need humanitarian help, uh, they need help uh, rebuilding already uh, the infrastructure. They, they are not waiting end of the war and then building uh, Ukraine. They have to build it uh, every day because Russia is attacking uh, all the infrastructure very heavily. Um, so we need to give them help, whatever they need. And it's their job to decide what are the terms that they could agree, what are uh, the, the victory points that they need to receive. I think that Russia should leave Ukraine and they think that in too. every territory, but it's their decision. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think a very important headline is always for us, nothing about Ukraine without Ukraine. Right. 
they have to decide what for them finally is the point to sit down at the negotiation. I, I mean, to be fair, they have laid it out in 10 point plans, five Which is good plans. and which we've They've laid support. it out. I, I need to go to audience questions. Maybe some of these could be, and then I'm going to come back and ask you a final question. So, this, this uh, session is also entitled The EU More Than the Sum of Its Parts. I'm not exactly sure what that is, but if anybody wants to ask any questions, we've got about maybe seven minutes for questions. Uh, the lady here? Yes, you. Mm -hmm. And please make it a question and not a speech because we don't have time. <laughs> President von der Leyen, Natalie Tocci, President von der Leyen, back to the knock on effects of, uh, of the war and in particular the energy crisis. Now, from a European standpoint, intra European standpoint, we've done fantastically well over the last year. Looking at it globally, perhaps slightly less so, in the sense that the LNG hoarding that many of our countries have been doing have, in a sense, contributed uh, to the energy crisis. Looking ahead to the next year, what is it that the EU could be doing more in order to address that global energy crisis? Yeah. So indeed, uh, we should not forget how it started, the energy crisis. Um, of course, an over-dependency of uh, the European Union on Russian fossil fuels, without any question. But then it was Putin who, within eight months, cut 80% of the pipeline gas supply to the European Union. Um, big strategic mistake, big. Because he thought we, he could blackmail us that we go down on our knees. The contrary is the case, because we have now completely diversified away from the Russian gas. Um, also, thanks to the stepping up of our friends, the United States with LNG, uh, Norway with more pipeline gas, but more important is even that it accelerated our work in the European Green Deal. So we heavily invested in renewable energy, which is homegrown, it gives us independence, and it's clean. We have doubled the additional deployment of renewables last year in the European Union, and last year for the very first time, wind and solar delivered more electricity than, um, than gas did. What the other countries are concerned because and important is that we keep in mind that uh, the tightness, the energy tightness of the global market is due to Russia's invasion in Ukraine. We should never forget that. But what indeed other countries are that suffer also from uh, this energy crisis, what they are concerned, for us is important that our work together, for example, with the Global South, with Africa, is intensified on investment in infrastructure to have renewable energy, to produce, for example, green hydrogen. Uh, we're working now with the uh, other side of the Mediterranean exactly on that one. So the big paradox of this conflict is if there's an accelerator for the European Green Deal and for global infrastructure in renewable energy than it's Putin and with his atrocious war. Uh, yes? Alex Sikorsky, member of the European Parliament. Uh, my question is to the President of the Council. Um, <clears throat> of, the, of the Commission, of course. Um, we were lucky that the United States had Joe Biden as President uh, when uh, Putin invaded and that they took the lead on helping Ukraine. But next time, they, be, they may be otherwise engaged in the Far East. Um, thank you for your leadership in using Europe's small defense budget for, for supplying Ukraine. But shouldn't that defense budget and Europe's military capability be much bigger in the future? I think we have to invest more in defense without any question. Um, but your insinuation that um, it might be um, possible that we cannot so much work together with our transatlantic friends. Um, it was very reassuring. Yesterday I had a panel with Mitch McConnell and it was good to hear that he was very clear about the commitment of uh, the whole of the United States uh, to support Ukraine and to fight side by side with us uh, for the defense of our values, without any question. What our defense um, capabilities are concerned, of course it's sovereign decisions of the member states, but indeed we have progressed a lot in the European Union what um, harmonizing of the approach to the defense capabil capabilities is concerned. It has very weird names, acronyms like PESCO, like CARD, you name it, but uh, this is good, 
thanks God we have it in place. We can build on that one. But yes, the emphasis has to be on a stronger defense posture. Prime Minister Marin, do you think your country, your people, your policies, because it's you who have to do that. It's e each country that has to decide, right? Are you ready? Because we heard that the peace dividend, uh-uh, we're out of that, that time now. Your defense budgets have to be ramped up. Well, actually, Finland has always invested uh, heavily on defense because we are our next door neighbor to Russia. We are already using uh, up to 2% of our budget uh, to defense, and we will increase this uh, even more so because we want to be prepared. And actually, when we look back uh, to this war and the energy crisis that we are in, Finland already versified our energy mix way before uh, the war because we have aggressive neighbor, and we don't want that kind of dependencies uh, that, that many other countries have had. Uh, I understand the logic, and it's very logical to build those very close economic connections and ties uh, to try to make sure that the war wouldn't happen, because we have such a close ties, it would be so costly uh, that, that we couldn't uh, then see these kind of uh, devastating things happening. But uh, this wasn't the case, because the authoritarian <laughs> regimes, they think differently. And in the future, we have to be more prepared also when it comes, for example, new technologies. And I, I totally agree. Uh, I think United States, they will uh, look towards Asia uh, even more so in the future. And we have to make sure that, that we are not dependent on those critical uh, matters that we are too dependent now. During the pandemic, we were too dependent on, on medicine, we were too dependent on med medical equipment, on the energy crisis, we are too dependent on Russian uh, fossil fuels. Luckily and thankfully, we, ha we have done uh, very much uh, to get rid of uh, those connections. But in the future, the big, big issue will be new technologies. Technologies, know-how, knowledge. So we have to also invest in our education system, the know-how, the knowledge base, and new technologies that we are not dependent on authoritarian countries from the East. Because there might be dark clouds uh, also in that direction. And if we have those connections, if we are too dependent, then we are also... Um, we are... We, 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 we cannot be sure that, to, that we are secure in that uh, perspective as well. So our job is to make sure that our um, citizens, our societies will cope whatever happens in the world. So we have to invest, European Union has have to invest, and also member states ha has to invest more in these critical matters. I, I would like to, before I, before I go to the audience again, if I get some time, I need to ask you both a question about the 50%. This conference is meant to be you know, 50% women. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't. You might have just seen, obviously, um, Jacinda Ardern, hugely popular Prime Minister of, of New Zealand, resign, citing she hasn't got any more energy in the tank. Nicola Sturgeon, the First Minister, Minister of Scotland resigning into Ali are talking about how difficult it is, particularly as a woman, to lead any kind of normal life um, at, you know, as, as, a, as a global leader. Um, I wonder what you both think about that, because you're the first female in this position. You were the first female defense minister in your country. You've experienced sexism. So just briefly, how do you deal with it? What do you think about their stepping down? And how do you encourage women? I know that's a lot, but maybe just a brief, <laughs> a brief sum up, and then I'm going to ask you. Oh. Well, first of all, I'm so what? happy that we live in countries where leaders change. That's a good thing. Yeah. But Prime Minister, change. I was... For, uh, <laughs> That's all good, but if I was targeting yeah, yeah, this to you, I, I, I would ask you, yeah. why did you have to apologize for being a human being? You were found, you know, found dancing. Oh my goodness, how awful. Yeah. And you had to apologize for being a human being. Why? And I have also danced after that, uh, that, <laughs> that one time. Um, I think there's, of course, there's a lot to be done when it comes to gender equality. Um, it's very important that, that we have people from different backgrounds, different genders, uh, but also different backgrounds in decision-making uh, places uh, at the same, same table making the decisions, because then we have the perspective of everyone. Women are the 50% of the world, so women need to be 50% of the decision-making making, uh, bodies. I know that, that Ursula and, and the Commission uh, is preparing uh, to, to set uh, a bill for, 
for companies uh, to have more women representatives on the boards uh, of, of companies. I think this is a very important step forward. Uh, I think also in the political system we have to make sure that women have the possibilities to step up, uh, to have their voices heard. There are a lot of um, structures within our political systems that actually prevent women uh, to get those positions yeah, yeah. to be heard. Uh, many times it's enough that there's one woman. Look, we have this women here. No problem. We have women here, no problem. But we need more women, and we need really that 50% to make sure yeah. that everybody's voices are heard. So, Commissioner, I mean, President, um, why then is it so difficult? Why do you have to tolerate so much backlash, misogyny, everyday sexism, uh, all of that? Well, because there are deep-rooted uh, unconscious biases. But do you think um, that would discourage or encourage more women? Well, to I can only encourage more women uh, to uh, be on stage because that's where we belong, uh, in the limelight. And women or men, are the one or the others, are not better than uh, the other. But we're different. And that's the point um, that we have to, of course, take the share of the power um, to change this world and to improve this world. And I think for that, I mean, I know you've done a lot, uh, we are doing a lot. Um, you need leadership from the top. That is very important. Yeah. Every man on, in a top position, every woman in a top position has to influence um, that there are more women coming, uh, growing up to the top. Of course, it's also a question of infrastructure. So um, I vividly remember my most difficult time were the first years as a minister uh, with small children. And um, all these hidden prejudices, I got the question, I mean, in talks like these ones, have you already decided whether you want to be a bad mother or a bad minister? <laughs> so there was this, this hidden prejudice, you cannot be either a good minister or a good mother if you are a working mom. We all know these, uh, these prejudices. What we have to do is make sure that the infrastructure is there, that you have for young couples support with uh, what is necessary in kindergarten, childcare, and good schools. We have to make sure that till we have an equal distribution of men and women in positions of powers, I'm an advocate for a quota. That's the reason why we introduced a quota in Germany. That's the reason why we introduced the quota now on the European level because the time till women kind of grow natural through the ranks, naturally through the ranks, is just too long. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, still a lot is to do, but I can only recommend to women, uh, hang on there, um, because we need you, we need your voice, and it, it's absolutely important that you're there. I must add, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ursula. I must, I must add, because we are in the Munich Security Con uh, uh, Conference, I'm so proud uh, that the um, uh, former uh, Finnish uh, Minister for, for um, Defence uh, went to a parental leave. So he, he did uh, make that decision to, to went to a parental leave because they had a small child. So it's not only a job for mothers, it's also a job for fathers to take the time to spend it with your child, even though there's war in Europe, even though Finland is joining NATO. Our defense minister, uh, Antti Kaikkonen, decided that his child is small only once, and he did take that parental leave. And I'm so happy that this is the equality in Finland. Well, One great. little anecdote, if I may. Okay, they're making me rap, but hurry. Oh, okay. I had decided to have a gender-based uh, college in the commission. And um, I have to ask member states to send me candidates. So I told him, you send me a man and a woman that I can choose my commissioners for the college. You can't imagine the outcry on that one. <laughs> there were member states who sent me three men to choose from. So um, in the very end, I have my gender balanced college. Uh, so uh, be stubborn and stay uh, on the topic, then you will be successful. Well, two great examples. EU Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, Prime Minister of Finland, Sanna Marin, thank you very much for joining. That was really good. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you very much. That was wonderful.
You're watching BF24 live covering this year's Munich Security Conference. And coming up next, a conversation on the main stage, China in the world, with Wang Yi, director of the Office of the Central Foreign Affairs Commission of the People's Republic of China. It will begin momentarily, so just stay with us. You're watching BF24 live. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the program will continue in an instant. Please remain seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the president of the Munich Security Foundation Council, Wolfgang Ischinger. Please do take your seats. Please do take your seats. A highlight of this, uh, of this second day of the conference is about to begin. Please do take your seats. Thank you very much. We want to continue the proceedings. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, we're now going to have what I think has to be one of the highlights of this morning day two of the Munich Security Conference, China. Um, the world's attention has been focused for the last uh, days, weeks, months on China, on the Chinese-US relationship. And I'm extremely happy to um, announce that after we had um, Mr. Wang Yi uh, on screen, because of the pandemic a year ago, we now have him in person. Last year, he was still the foreign minister of the People's Republic of China. He is now, of course, not only a, a state councillor, but he, more recently, uh, he has been named the director of the Central Foreign Affairs Commission of China. And that means that we are going to be listening to his remarks now uh, as the senior most foreign policy representative of China. I want to offer you, sir, a very warm welcome. We're extremely pleased that you've uh, uh, made it possible to come to Munich again um, Mr. Wang Yi has been, I can say that, a, a, a regular participant for quite a number of years, and I'm extremely happy to offer you the floor, and then we'll have time for a few questions later on. Thank you very much, sir. Please. Dear friends, colleagues, I am delighted to join you in person at the Munich Security Conference after three years and meet face to face with friends old and new. I recall vividly how I came here with the Chinese delegation three years ago when COVID 19 just struck. You, Mr. Ischinger, 
chaired and moderated the Conversation with China session. I presented China's efforts in fighting the virus and urged solidarity among countries in face of the trying times. The international community gave China valuable support and understanding for which we are deeply grateful. Humanity's three-year fight against COVID-19 tells us a simple truth. As President Xi Jinping repeatedly stressed, we are members of one global village and we belong to one community with a shared future. We can overcome challenges when we stand together. We can win victory when we trust each other. Three years on, the pandemic is contained, but the world is not yet safer. Trust between major countries is lacking. Geopolitical rifts are widening. Unilateralism is rampant. The Cold War mentality is back. New types of security threats from energy, food, climate, biosecurity, and artificial intelligence keep emerging. Standing at a critical juncture of history, human society must not repeat the path of antagonism, division, and confrontation, and must not fall into the trap of zero-sum game, war, and conflict. Making the world a safer place is the strong desire of all people, the common responsibility of all countries, and more importantly, the right direction for the advance of our times. For a safer world, the sovereignty and territorial integrity of all countries must be respected. Power politics and hegemony are a recipe for global instability and do the biggest damage to global peace. Interference in other countries' internal affairs, in whatever name, disregards and defies the basic norms of international relations. Any violation of the One China principle on the Taiwan question, an attempt to create One China, One Taiwan, or Two Chinas, however framed, are a gross infringement on China's territorial integrity and pose real threats to peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait. The principle of sovereignty is the cornerstone of the contemporary international order. All countries should abide by the principle in both words and deeds, rather than apply it selectively, still less with double standards. China will resolutely curb acts of separatism and interference to safeguard its sovereignty and territorial integrity. For a safer world, disputes should be peacefully, peacefully resolved through dialogue and consultation. Disagreements and frictions do exist between countries, yet handling them with pressuring, smear campaigns or unilateral sanctions is often counterproductive and may even entail endless trouble. However complex the issue is, dialogue and consultation should not be abandoned. However intense the dispute is, a political resolution should be pursued. However difficult the situation is, peace should be given a chance. China follows a new vision of common, comprehensive, cooperative and sustainable security as put forward by President Xi Jinping. China takes a responsible stance on international disputes based on the merits of each issue and plays a constructive role. On the Ukraine issue, China's position boils down to supporting talks for peace. We will put forth China's position on the political settlement on the Ukraine crisis and stay firm on the side of peace and dialogue. For a safer world, the purposes and principles of the UN Charter should be upheld. The chaos and conflicts plaguing our world today occur because the purposes and principles of the Charter have not been truly observed. Fanning ideological confrontation and forming exclusionary blocks harms international solidarity and hampers global cooperation. Hyping security threats and stoking tensions undercuts strategic mutual trust and elevates the risk of miscalculation. The pressing need now is for all of us to put the larger interest embodied in the purposes and principles of the UN Charter above one's own lesser interest and work together to oppose Cold War mentality and block confrontation. 
For a safer world, the key role of development must be harnessed. The world should not be a place where the rich stay rich while the poor remain poor. Efforts should be stepped up in implementing the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The legitimate right to development of all countries, especially developing countries, should be effectively protected. And assistance should be extended to underdeveloped regions to improve people's lives and grow the economy. A holistic approach is needed to address both symptoms and root causes and remove the breeding ground for conflict. The world should not veer off onto the wrong path of protectionism, decoupling and cutting chains. We must firmly reject the attempts to politicize, weaponize and draw ideological lines in the cooperation on trade, science and technology. If security is to be firmly established and endure, people in all countries should get to lead a better life. Making the world a safer place is China's abiding commitment. Last October, the Communist Party of China convened its 20th National Congress. General Secretary Xi Jinping declared that China's central task in the new era and on the new journey is to advance the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation on all fronts through a Chinese path to modernization. On how to accomplish this modernization of the largest scale in human history, China has given an unequivocal and steadfast answer, keeping to peaceful development. Peaceful development is not an expediency nor diplomatic rhetoric, but a strategic choice informed by a deep grasp of the past, present and future. Looking over the past, China suffered deeply from foreign aggression and expansion in modern times. This country fully appreciates the value of peace and importance of development. Shortly after the founding of New China, we put forward the five principles of peaceful coexistence. Over the past 70 plus years, China has never initiated a war or occupied an inch of foreign land. It is the only country that has put peaceful development in its constitution and the only country among the five nuclear weapon states to pledge no first use of nuclear weapons. China's track record on peace can stand the scrutiny of history, and its peaceful rise is an unprecedented miracle in human history. At present, the top priority for the for China is to pursue high-quality development and deliver a better life for the Chinese people. We know fully well that development is only possible in a peaceful and tranquil international environment. This requires that China lives in peace with other countries and pursues win-win cooperation with the rest of the world. We will always be an advocate for peace development and win-win cooperation and work to deepen and expand global partnerships based on equality, openness and cooperation. Looking to the future, peace and development remain the trend of history and the aspiration of the people. Some people assert that a strong country is bound to seek hegemony and assume that China will walk away from peaceful development as it gets stronger. However, China's own experience shows that the path of peaceful development has worked and worked well. There is no reason for us to discontinue, but every reason to stay the course and come together with more countries in the pursuit of peaceful development. Any increase in China's strength is an increase in the hope of world peace. When all countries pursue peaceful development, the future of humanity will be full of promise. With a keen grasp of the changing world, President Xi Jinping put forward the Global Development Initiative, GDI, and the Global Security Initiative, GSI, in recent years, offering China's proposals and wisdom for advancing peace and development, the two main issues facing humanity. As of now, more than 100 countries and international organizations, including the UN, have expressed support for the two initiatives. Some 70 countries have joined the group of friends of the GDI. I am pleased to announce here that China will be launching a GSI concept paper to lay out a more systematic approach and more practical measures to address global security challenges. We welcome your active participation. Friends, making the world a safer place also hinges on the right choice of both China and Europe. China and Europe 
are two major forces, markets and civilizations in an increasingly multipolar world. The choices we make have a huge impact on where the world goes. If we choose dialogue and cooperation, block confrontation will not emerge. If we choose peace and stability, a new Cold War will not break out. If we choose openness and win-win, global development and prosperity will have greater hope. Making the right choice is the responsibility we share. This is how we respond to the call of history and the needs of the people. Here in Munich stands the Angel of Peace, a renowned monument marking the end of a war and embodying the wish for lasting peace. Long as the journey is, we will reach our destination if we stay the course. Difficult as the task is, we will get the job done if we keep working at it. Let us all join hands and work together to make the world a safer place. Now, I'm happy to take your questions and exchange views with you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. State Councillor, for your uh, uh, presentation. Um, you mentioned early on in your remarks, you referred to the war in Ukraine. Um, and um, I would like to ask a follow-up question on that, on that. But before I do that, I want to attract your personal attention and that of your delegation and that of all the participants uh, in this hall here today, that we have not more than 30 seconds or a minute from the hall in the building here, an exhibition about Russian war crimes. And I invite everybody, including certainly the Chinese delegation, to uh, take a moment during the day to um, look at these rather gripping photographs and, and videos. Um, I think it's an essential element um, of our proceedings here today. Now, my question is a very simple one, actually. A year ago, when you, when you appeared on the video screen and you could not be here physically because of the at that time continuing uh, pandemic situation, um, you stated that China respects the territorial integrity, the sovereignty of Ukraine. If I remember correctly, you said just like we respect the territorial integrity of any other member state of the United Nations. Now, that was a remark made four days before the outbreak of the current war of aggression. And my very simple question to you is, now that we have had for 12 months this ongoing war, is China prepared to act on its position that it respects the territorial integrity? And if you are prepared to act, what are you prepared to do? You spoke in your remarks of your willingness to participate in the reflection of how to bring about peace. So could you elaborate a little bit on that? Thank you. Uh, to see the crisis, the crisis in Ukraine. And we are deeply concerned by the expanded and extended crisis. We are not a party directly concerned, but we did not sit idly by. We do not add f fewer to the fire, 
and we are against reaping benefits from this crisis. What we have been doing is to facilitate peace talks, but we stand on the side of peace and dialogue. As a matter of fact, since the second day of the crisis, on the 25th of February, President Xi Jinping suggested that Russia and Ukraine sit down together and talk to each other to seek political settlement of the crisis. In Belarus, in Turkey, there were multiple rounds of peace talks. And we saw a framework text on the peaceful resolution of the crisis. However, that was stopped. We did not know why the process was cut short. Some forces might not want to see peace talks to materialize. They don't care about the life and death of Ukrainians, not the harms on Europe. They might have strategic goals larger than Ukraine itself. This warfare must not continue. During his meeting with European leaders, President Xi Jinping said clearly that conflicts and wars produce no winner. Complicated issues cannot be solved by simple, simple solutions. Major country confrontation must be averted. We can state our positions on this stage, but at the same time, we need to think calmly, especially our friends in Europe, about what efforts should be made to stop the warfare, what framework should there be to bring lasting peace to Europe? What role should Europe play to manifest its strategic autonomy? The more difficult situation is we cannot abandon efforts to seek peace. We are approaching the one-year anniversary. China will put forth a position paper on the political settlement of the Ukraine issue. We will reiterate the propositions made by President Xi Jinping in our position paper, including that territorial integrity and sovereignty must be respected, purposes and principles of the UN Charter be observed, legitimate security concerns be taken seriously, and all efforts conducive to the peaceful settlement of the crisis be supported. We will also reiterate that nuclear wars must not be fought and will not be won. We must oppose such an incident. We will call on efforts to oppose attacks on nuclear power stations and nuclear facilities for peaceful use in order to prevent nuclear catastrophe. We must jointly oppose the use of chemical and biological weapons under any circumstances. Our efforts to promote peace will continue. Put simply, we will work with all sides, sustain our efforts, and work until the day peace arrives. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Now, I have collected a couple of questions. We have very limited time, but among the questions most urgently asked are questions about the relationship between China and the United States. We have all recently witnessed the, what I may call, with your permission, the balloon crisis. Um, and um, my question is a very simple one. Um, are you going to, and is your delegation, going to use the opportunity of this Munich Security Conference platform 
which is actually an ideal platform for these types of purposes, to enter into a discussion with those present from the uh, Joe Biden administration um, to return, hopefully, to a somewhat more normal level of discourse between Beijing and Washington, because, of course, you have some larger issues to discuss uh, above and beyond the balloon crisis. But my impression has been that the balloon crisis has stood in the way of returning to a more normal discussion. Please. Uh, it seems that everyone is following very closely the balloon incident and has become a, the center of heated discussions. I'll talk about some facts. We have very clearly told the United States this is an unmanned airship that is civilian in nature. It has limited self-steering capability and veered off course into the United States due to westerly influence. We asked the United States to handle it calmly and professionally based on consultation with the Chinese side. Regrettably, the United States disregards these facts and use advanced fighter jets and downed a balloon with its missiles. This is, I would say, absurd and hysterical. This is a 100% abuse of the use of force. It is a violation of international customary practice, in particular, the Chicago Convention on International Civil Aviation. We do not accept this. We have launched the march against the United States. Across the globe, there are many balloons in the sky from different countries. Do you want to down each and every one of them? It does not show America is strong. On the contrary, it shows the opposite. We urge the United States not to do such preposterous things simply to divert attention from its domestic problems. We also urge the United States to be more sincere, rectifying its wrong approach and undo the negative impact such measures have on China-U.S. relations. Why such sensation? The basic context is misperception of the United States and a strategic miscalculation on the part of the U.S. China's position to the United States is clear and transparent. Mutual respect, peaceful coexistence, and win-win cooperation. These are the principles, the three principles on how we get along with the United States, how two major countries with different systems can get along with each other in the world. What response do we get? The response from the U.S. side is that the U.S. says China is a serious geopolitical challenge, a long-term competitor, and a threat to the United States. This, I would say, is a misguided China perception. With this perception, the United States is using all of its means to clamp down and smear China, and is co-opting other countries to do the same. China said or stated that it wants to compete with China we are not afraid of competition, but we want fair and rules-based competition. The United States is not doing it. For instance, the CHIPS Act. 
this act as 100% protectionism, 100% selfishness, 100% unilateral action. It is in serious violation of the principle of free trade, the rules of WTO. This, by no means, is fair competition. It cannot be farther away from free competition. The U.S. is standing on the opposite side of free trade that has long espoused. This is pretty ironic. In ancient China, we Chinese often say that even if people love benefits, they get it through fair means. Only people with selfish purposes will only get it with this extortion. The United States has only been extorting benefits. We do hope that the U.S. side can view China's development objectively, impartially. Modernization of 1.4 billion people marks progress of humanity. I don't understand why the U.S. is stopping this process. We hope the U.S. side would take a pragmatic and proactive attitude towards China and work together with China to return our bilateral ties to a to a track of sound development. This not only meets the benefit of our two countries, but also of the international community. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, the team signals to me that our time is already up. But uh, I, I don't think, sir, that this uh, discussion would be uh, uh, complete if we didn't have at least one final minute, we don't have more time than that, for you to reassure this audience that a military escalation over the Taiwan issue is not imminent. Briefly assure the audience that Taiwan is part of Chinese territory. It is never, it has never been a country, and it will not be a country in the future. This is the status quo of the Taiwan question. It is not China who wants to change the status quo, but Taiwan separatist forces on the island. Taiwan independence forces undermines peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. That is why we must oppose Taiwan independence and Taiwan separatism. We must observe one China principle. This is also a consensus of the international community. We reiterate the importance of respecting sovereignty and territorial integrity. This is good. We hope that on China, sovereignty and territorial integrity should also be respected because Taiwan separatist forces are threatening our sovereignty and territorial integrity. We don't hope to see double standards on this issue of major significance. That is my answer. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. It's been a real privilege to have you on stage here again. Do come again next year if you can. Thank you. Well, that has been quite a lot up until now, so I am more than delighted that he is joining us once again to put everything into the right perspective. Clemens Fehrenkotte, former correspondent in Southeast Europe and Washington, D.C., now live on the ground at Hotel Bayerischer Hof. Clemens, thanks for being with us, and maybe let's start with what we just watched, China. What is China's stance on and point of view regarding the Russian war against Ukraine? Well, it was really uh, interesting what the, the, the head of Chinese foreign policy, Wang Ji, just said and reiterated. He was insisting on the principle of sovereignty and in territorial independence. And he regarded these principles, vice versa, to Taiwan and the question of one China policy. This was something which he really stressed. And so far, he was saying, one thing is we have to have territorial integrity. Second thing that was important saying, no use of nuclear weapons. This was kind of reassuring. 
But the third thing was really, uh, Ambassador Ishinger was just asking the final question, saying, can you assure us in this audience that there won't be a kind of intimate military attack on Taiwan? And he was just saying, well, we have to make sure there is just one China. There is no Taiwan, he was saying. So he was really putting up, I wouldn't say just a, a show of power, but making really clear where he stands and where China stands on these issues. Another topic that has been a part of this conversation um, has been the relationship to the United States and giving the last, well, let's at least call them tensions between China and the U.S. with a shot down spy balloon. How far are we from a next clash of global players? I mean, uh, Wang Ji was repeating what the official policy after this incident with the so-called spy balloon over the coast of the Carolinas uh, had been uh, since days, since that it happens, was saying it was a violation by the United States to shoot this balloon down. He further said the United States is trying to really impose new sanctions on China, especially on the high-tech end of, of trade. We're saying this is not fair and they are insisting on fairness. But you have to keep in mind uh, Chinese foreign policy is also anxious to re-engage with the United States because the last year hadn't been a very happy year for, for China and the Chinese rulers if you look at the COVID policy and the COVID policy afterwards. So there's an interest in China to, I wouldn't say re-engage, but to open up again the channel to Washington. And this will happen here. We will just moments away from the address of the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and also here is, for sure, as we all know, the Secretary of State, Anthony Blinken. And Blinken and Wang Ji, they will talk here. And for sure, we have lots of rooms and they have lots of backdoor talks. And this will be one of it. But bottom line is uh, they basically want to get in touch again with the U.S. administration because there are so many important issues for them on the table. Let's focus on Europe because we all also watched a panel with Ursula von der Leyen, President of the European Commission, and Sanna Marin, Finland's Prime Minister. Since the beginning of the war, is Europe more united or divided than ever? What is your impression? Well, I think Ursula von der Leyen really made a point, and it was really a good fortune that the very young Finnish Prime Minister Marin was on the panel as well. And uh, my impression was that is isn't kind of a political show in terms of, yeah, we are united and we are determined to go on with this. Because the core of the argument had been that it's really about values. I think uh, the, the, the Finnish prime minister, she really put it very clearly on the table saying it's about our existence. And I said the most important thing, and you have to keep in mind after uh, February 24th, Finland and, and Sweden were immediately applying for NATO membership and it's still uh, it's not happening because of uh, the veto of uh, the Turkish president Tayyip Erdogan but she was saying the Finnish interest was to be independent to have a free life and to do the decisions by their own and the moment the tanks rolled from uh, Russia and Belarus uh, one year ago into Ukraine was saying this is the moment where we know that it's about our existence. So coming back to your question is do I have the idea that the unity still fits? Yes I do. Well part of this panel also would have been Giorgia Meloni um, the Prime Minister of Italy from the party Fratella d'Italia but she called in sick but this has been a development we could have um, watched um, in Europe the, that right-wing parties won elections. Is this also a consequence of this more and more complex world? Well, obviously, obviously there are too many cell phones here and maybe sometimes this can happen too. If uh, a high-ranking U.S. official comes into town or wherever they are, and especially if the vice president, president of the United States, for a couple of moments they block 
all internet access for seconds, like it's like a black box, <laughs> and then it reappears again, and maybe we are in this kind of uh, uh, truly signal <laughs> that uh, the vice president uh, is about to, to approach uh, the floor, and this might be one of the reasons, but we can catch up uh, afterwards this afternoon. I think uh, we see and talk to each other uh, in the afternoon uh, after 4 p.m., and I would be delighted if then uh, the cell phone and blocking net problems will be resolved. Well then, thank you so much, Clemens, for being with us as long as this was possible. And we'll see each other again this afternoon. And up next, Beyond the Alliance, partnering up for European security. You're watching BR24 Live, and we'll be right back after this.
Welcome back. You're watching BF24 live on this year's Munich Security Conference. Coming up next, Beyond the Alliance, partnering up for European security. A panel discussion, starting with a scene setting by NATO's Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. So we want to get this session started. So the title of our session is Beyond the Alliance partnering for European security. And I have a confession to make. I was quarreling a little bit with this title. So I'm going to take the moderator's prerogative and suggest that we rename this session Building the Alliance and Strengthening European Security. And as we build this alliance, our panelists represent many of the building blocks of this alliance. We have the Prime Minister of the Kingdom of Denmark, a founding member of NATO. We have Finnish President Ninistu, our newest family member, we hope very soon, into NATO. And of course, we have Moldovan President Maya Sandu, a, a Moldova as a long-standing partner of NATO. So I can think of no better person to help us frame building the alliance at this extraordinary moment than one of the architects of our modern NATO alliance, the second longest serving secretary general in NATO history. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg assumed his duties on October 1, 2014. That was when NATO began its Zeitenwende, as we began to understand the European security situation was beginning to change. Secretary General Stoltenberg has navigated many diplomatic challenges, uh, and we, we turn to him now to help us set the scene for how we build this alliance anew. So with your applause, please welcome Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Thank you so much, uh, Heather, and uh, it's great to be back in uh, Munich and uh, great to be here together with uh, Mette, uh, Sauli and, uh, and Maya. And uh, I look forward to our conversation in uh, just uh, a few uh, moments. Russia's uh, war against Ukraine grinds on. We may be shocked by its brutality, but we should not be surprised. This is part of a pattern of Russian aggression for several years, and NATO allies shared precise intelligence about Moscow's plans for an inv invasion long in advance. Over many months, we made every effort to engage Russia in diplomacy. And just days before, on this very stage in Munich, I called on President Putin to step back from the brink. But despite our calls for peace, he chose to attack. We can already draw some important lessons from the war. First, we must sustain and step up our support to Ukraine. Putin is not planning for peace. He is planning for more war, new offensives. And there are no indications he has changed his ambitions. He is mobilizing hundreds of thousands of troops, increasingly putting the Russian economy on a war footing, and reaching out to other authoritarian regimes, such as Iran and North Korea, to get more weapons. So we must give Ukraine what they need to win and prevail as a sovereign independent nation in Europe. Some worry that um, our support to Ukraine risks triggering escalation. Let me be clear. There are no risk-free options. But the biggest risk of all is if Putin wins. If Putin wins in Ukraine, the message to him and other authoritarian leaders will be that they can use force to get what they want. This will make the world more dangerous 
and us more vulnerable. So supporting Ukraine is not only the morally right thing to do, it is also in our own security interest. The second lesson is that we need to continue to strengthen our deterrence and defense. Wars are unpredictable, and we do not know when or how this one will end. But I do know this. Even if the war ends tomorrow, our security environment has changed for the long term. There is no going back. Kremlin wants a different Europe, one where Russia controls neighbors. We also know that Beijing is watching closely to see the price Russia pays or the reward it receives for its aggression. What is happening in Europe today could happen in Asia tomorrow. So the war in Ukraine demonstrates that security is not regional, it is global. In this new and more contested world, we cannot longer afford to treat defense as optional. It is a necessity. Yes, spending more on defense means less money for other important tasks. But nothing is more important than our security to preserve peace. The third lesson is that we need to strengthen the resilience of our societies. Military forces are necessary to protect our security, but they are not sufficient. We must also secure our cyberspace, our supply chains, and our infrastructure. The war in Ukraine has made clear the danger of over-reliance on authoritarian regimes. Not so long ago, many argued that importing Russian gas was purely an economic issue. It is not. It is a political issue. It is about our security. Because Europe's dependency on Russian gas made us vulnerable. So we should not make the same mistakes with China and other authoritarian regimes. We must not become too dependent on products and raw materials we import, avoid exporting key technologies that could be used against us, and protect our critical infrastructure at home. Of course, we should continue to trade and engage economically with China. But our economies and our economic interests cannot outweigh our security interests. So it's only right that we protect ourselves. But in doing so, we must remember that trade among friends and allies makes us stronger and more resilient. We must not create new barriers between free and open economies. The most important lesson from the war in Ukraine is that North America and Europe must stand together. In a more dangerous world, we need our transatlantic alliance more than ever. Without NATO, there is no security in Europe. So this is not the time to look beyond the alliance. This is the time to strengthen and enlarge our alliance. To promote peace, protect our shared security, and defend a global system based on our values and international law. Thank you, and then I look forward to our conversation. Secretary, Secretary General Stoltenberg, thank you. And let me please welcome our panelists to, to the platform. And, and while they're walking up, um, uh, Secretary General, if I may start with you. Okay, we'll, we'll do the handshake first here. Thank you, welcome. Secretary General, while everyone's getting uh, seated, if I may just ask you the first question. And I want to pull on your, the, the unthinkable, but if Putin wins, as you suggested that, 
NATO would have to incredibly strengthen the eastern flank, its NATO spending. 2% would be the absolute floor. How do we as an alliance prepare for the unthinkable, and what does that alliance look like for the next 10, 15, 20 years? So first of all, President Putin must not win this war, and that's uh, why NATO allies and parties all around the world has mobilized so much support to, uh, to Ukraine because it will be a tragedy for the Ukrainians, but it will also be extremely dangerous for us. Uh, because then the message is uh, that uh, when he uses force, then he gets what he, he wants. And we need to understand this, this is not only a European challenge, this is a global challenge. I, I, I recently visited South Korea and, uh, and uh, Japan, two close partners of NATO, and they see the link between what's going on in Europe and what's going on and may happen in Asia. So Beijing is watching closely uh, the outcome of the war in Ukraine. Uh, and of course, uh, if Putin wins in Ukraine, it will uh, uh, impact the decisions uh, and the calculations that Beijing is doing in their part of the world. So this is about our global security. This is not about regional security. NATO has already adapted. The war didn't start in February last year. It started uh, in 2014. Uh, and since 2014, we have implemented the biggest reinforcement of collective defense with more troops, higher readiness, presence in the eastern part of the alliance, new defense plans, uh, and also increased defense spending. And when we meet in Vilnius this year, I'm absolutely certain that we will uh, also reconfirm that message, uh, both the stronger partnership with our partners in the Asia-Pacific, support for Ukraine, but also how to strengthen our deterrence uh, and defense. Secretary General, I want one more question to you, and then I want to bring our other panelists into the conversation. So in five months, the Allies will gather in Vilnius, an incredibly important summit. At the end of that summit, what does success look like for you and for the Alliance? Well, so success is about uh, demonstrating uh, uh, the, the, the unwavering support for Ukraine, and I'm absolutely confident that that will, uh, confident that that will be the case in Vilnius. It's about uh, uh, reiterating our commitment to strengthen our deterrence and defense, and it's about building the partnership with our Asia-Pacific uh, uh, partners, because security is not regional, security is uh, global. But then there is one other thing that will uh, mark success. And that is that we will enlarge the alliance. Uh, I, I really uh, uh, work hard uh, and, and really hope that by the Vilnius summit we will have finalized the accession process and we have Finland and Sweden as the two uh, new members of our alliance. Uh, Secretary General, that's the perfect segue to uh, opening our conversation with President Ninistu. But before I get to the accession question, uh. President Ninistu, other than Former Chancellor Merkel, you probably have had the most conversations with Vladimir Putin, um, and it was important to keep that dialogue. I would imagine your last conversation was when uh, you shared with him that uh, Finland was applying for NATO membership. But I want to ask you, because your knowledge of Vladimir Putin and you've observed his leadership over the last 12 months, help us understand where you think this regime is going. It's been under enormous stress, and I, you have some of the sharpest analytical thinking about Russia, and then I'm going to ask you that accession question, but I want to start there first. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I have heard uh, said uh, that uh, the Russian regime is the same in the future, if not even more of the same, and we know what uh, the same is here. So. Uh, we haven't seen any major changes except that uh, maybe the leadership is more concentrated on Putin and the uh, amount of elite people around him is maybe reducing a bit. Uh, those uh, more from the business side are maybe far further away at the moment. Uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, military is number one in Russian uh, society, in their economy, in their industry, whatever. And uh, I guess that they are measuring this situation all the time, the Ukrainian war, by their military success. And that's the only figure that really 
that they really care about. And that also explains that uh, uh, what is going on and uh, I'm afraid uh, will continue. So something like this. More of the same, greater intensity which moves us to the urgency of uh, Finland and Sweden uh, formally joining the alliance. So, and, uh, Secretary General, I may be bringing you into this conversation as well because I want to make sure I understand where we are in the process. Um, you were just in Ankara uh, visiting uh, with uh, senior Turkish officials. Obviously, the devastation of the earthquake is, is unimaginable. But we now have this challenge of a timeline to get to the Vilnius summit. So you were very clear, Secretary General in Ankara, saying both Sweden and Finland are ready, but, and we want them to enter as soon as possible. But this suggests that, as our Turkish colleagues have suggested, that they, will, they are ready to approve Finland to enter. The Finnish parliament is making the preparations to do that. President, I just, I need the clarity. We know we want F Finland and Sweden to come together. That's the goal. But if we must, and if Turkey, and of course Hungary, uh, approves the accession, ratifies the accession protocols, only for Finland, would Finland walk through that door by itself? And if so, Secretary General, what are the implications for that scenario? Okay, our position is uh, crystal clear. We with Sweden, we have uh, made an application expressing our will to join NATO. And that will is uh, uh, considered by member states. 28 of them have uh, accepted us. Then to Turkey. Turkey, uh, it's in their hands. Uh, we have got messages, uh, and you have to be quite keen when you hear messages from Turkey. Uh, they may change every now and then. But uh, nevertheless, uh, we have heard uh, them saying also that in an increasing way that Finland, uh, yes, uh, Finland uh, meets uh, criteria which they have put, which are a bit uh, different from those criteria of NATO. But um, little by little, they have increased uh, in expressing that they might ratify Finland uh, and just Finland. And even uh, we have heard some voices that if Finland is willing to this kind of separation. And our answer is very clear. We have expressed our will together with Sweden, and we don't react at all. We will not uh, accept or demand any kind of separation. But still, the situation is such that uh, uh, our applications are at the table uh, in Ankara, and uh, if Turkey decides that yes, they will answer yes to Finland, but not yet yes to Sweden, uh, well, that would be quite a, uh, quite a difficult uh, situation. Our hands are in a way tied. We have applied for membership. Should we now say that, no, we cancel our application? No, that we can't simply do. So uh, that's how it looks like. But uh, I want to assure that uh, uh, we, we have done our part by applying applying together with uh, Sweden, that's our will to become a member. And it's in Turkish hands to decide whether they want to have us. Secretary General, this is a dilemma. And I think you've done an excellent job of trying to manage the we want them both in. But we may anticipate a pacing issue here. How do we continue to provide that strong message of solidarity and security, particularly as we get closer to the Vilnius summit? First of all, NATO has made uh, the decisions we need, need to make as an alliance already. Uh, we made an historic decision uh, uh, at our summit in July to invite Finland and Sweden to become members. And then we all made a decision uh, uh, to agree the accession protocols, and all allies have signed accession protocols. So the NATO decisions have been made. 
What now remains is the ratification process of those protocols in all the 30 allied countries. So far, 28 out of 30 have already ratified, and then uh, Turkey and, uh, and uh, Hungary uh, remains. Of course, my message has been, uh, and it was also my message in Ankara uh, earlier this week, uh, that both Finland and Sweden are ready for uh, ratification. Uh, they have met the obligations uh, they signed with the trilateral uh, memorandum with Turkey uh, at the NATO summit uh, last uh, July, and therefore I urge all allies to finalize the ratification. Uh, but I also said that, uh, of course, what matters uh, is that both becomes, uh, become members as soon as possible, uh, not uh, whether uh, one become a member before the other. The most important is to get them both in as soon as possible. And I continue to work hard to ensure that they are members by uh, the Vilnius summit. If I can just add one more thing, and that is that this means that it is a Turkish decision because they have two protocols. And, uh, and uh, I urge the Turkey to, uh, to ratify both. Uh, but of course, if they ratify one, uh, then, uh, then, then Finland will be a, a member of the, uh, the alliance. Uh, last point is that we have to remember that Sweden and Finland are in a very much better place now than before they applied. It's not as if nothing has happened. They are now invitees, meaning that they're sitting at the NATO table. Uh, they participate in NATO meetings. They're more and more integrated in NATO military structures, defense planning, civilian and military activities. NATO has increased its presence in the area. Um, uh, uh, allies, United States and many other allies have, have uh, issued uh, assurances, uh, security assurances as part of the accession process. So it's inconceivable that there, uh, there will be any military threat against Finland or Sweden without NATO reacting. So yes, we need to finalize the process, but we've come a very long way already, both with Finland and Sweden. Thank you, thank you to you both. This is essential and as we understand uh, the next several weeks and months, so thank you. President Sandu, all leaders have tough weeks, but I think you've had a particularly um, tough week. And I, I want you to help us understand, of course, hearing news reports that um, intelligence had picked up a, a Russian malign operation in Moldova. It, to me, sounded very similar to 2016 in Montenegro, to be honest with you, that type of uh, disruption. If you could share with us what you can, sort of the, your understanding, you mentioned earlier this week that the situation is still highly destabilizing. Um, and uh, after you share that, how can we learn to better protect our societies from Russian malign influence? Uh, Moldova is certainly under enormous pressure right now. So welcome your thoughts on that. And then I turn to uh, how we can strengthen NATO's partnership with Moldova in these difficult days, please. Thank you. Uh, first, I would like to say that Russia's war against uh, Ukraine has enormous repercussions on every aspect of Moldova's security. Uh, it increased, including the military risk uh, for Moldova. In the last few months, we saw uh, four missiles uh, crossing illegally our airspace. Uh, we have many cases of rocket debris falling on our territory. Uh, we see uh, threats coming from different representatives of Russia, the recent one from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, who uh, indicated that Moldova might be the next in line. But um, as long as Ukraine keeps the Russian army far from our borders, we believe that there is not an imminent military threat to Moldova, and uh, Ukraine keeps us safe. At the same time, Russia is already waging a hybrid war against Moldova, and we have many examples. In the fall, they tried to use the energy crisis, hoping that we will not be able to pay for the very high prices for gas and electricity. When they saw that the government managed to find the money, uh, Gazprom cut gas supply by 60%, hoping that we will not find alternative sources and that uh, the paid protests will uh, overthrow the elected, the uh, legally elected government. Um, now we've learned about a new plan um, that they might bring, they might try to bring people from outside the country to organize these violent protests and then to force the authorities into negotiations on SNAP parliamentary elections. 
there are many elements uh, of this um, hybrid war. Of course, the most damaging to our democracy is propaganda and the disinformation. But there are multiple cyber attacks. Uh, there are multiple bomb, false bomb alerts. Um, and of course, uh, all of this is meant to destabilize the society uh, and to use the difficult economic uh, situation that we face because of, of uh, Russia's war in Ukraine uh, to, to bring people into the streets and then to, um, to change the government and to bring a pro-Russian government uh, that it could use also against uh, Ukraine. Thank you, President Sandu. <clears throat> Moldova has had a long-standing partnership with NATO. Uh, there's now a NATO liaison office uh, in Chisinau. As we think about building and strengthening our partnership, what are opportunities and ways that NATO can be more impactful in helping Moldova with security sector reform, strengthening and modernizing your defense structures? Give us some ideas as, as we continue to strengthen European security. Indeed, we do have a long-standing partnership with NATO, and we are very grateful, and we are very committed to our long-term plans. Uh, at the same time, we did uh, get or the promise for additional support at the Madrid summit. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, the priority now is to have um, projects with immediate impact, and the biggest problem that we have now is the need for air surveillance and air defense. And this is needed for Moldova, but this is also needed for the entire region. So we would like uh, our partners to consider this type of assistance that we urgently need. Uh, because of the um, internal threats of the hybrid uh, war, we also need to support to develop our strategic intelligence capabilities. Uh, to deal with the cyber threats. Uh, we need support to modernize our border security and control. Uh, we need support for special intervention um, focused capabilities. And I believe we need to work together and to be more efficient in tackling the Russian propaganda. It's extremely difficult for us to tackle this issue alone. I think we need to have common approaches on fighting the disinformation, the pro-war uh, propaganda. I think we need to have common approaches in dealing with the social networks which are not responsive to Moldova's requests when it comes to uh, the pro-war propaganda and to the disinformation. And uh, I do believe that they can take us seriously when we approach them together. But this is a very big issue. And as I said, the propaganda, the disinformation is probably now the most damaging uh, element for our society and for our democracy. Well, and your Moldova is very much a laboratory right now of that propaganda, so the alliance could learn an enormous amount. Prime Minister Fikrasin, um, as, as you've now, uh, re-election has happened, you've had an extraordinary year of leadership. I would say Denmark has had its own Zeitenwende when you, after the, um, the war began, the full-scale invasion, uh, Denmark taking the important step of joining common security and defense policy of the EU, committing a billion uh, in defense spending. What more needs to be done? I, and I think the one concern that I have as we get closer to the NATO summit is we are one year away from seeing how NATO members have fulfilled their Wales pledge of meeting 2% in 2024. We know Denmark will be shy of that despite uh, the increase in spending. Help us understand the leadership role that you've taken through this period and, and how Denmark is, is increasing its defense spending in this regard. Can I first of all say that, uh, Maya, you uh, are really a, a brave European president. I mean... Um, <laughs> Moldova is a small, it's a poor, and it's a fragile European country. You can be next in line when we're talking about Russia. And you are standing up you as a person for democracy, rule of law, and anti-corruption. So you are a brave European leader. And of course, all our awareness is about Ukraine. I totally agree with you, Jens. We have to do more and we have to do it faster. But at the same time, let us not forget Moldova, Georgia, 
and, and, uh, and other neighboring countries. So when you ask me what are the next thing to do, we have to and we need to spend more on our defense. Um, of course, that's number one. We have to do as much as we can to support Ukraine with weapons, more donations, and we have to do it faster. I think we have to work more closely together in Europe to keep up producing, because uh, it is extremely important to donate more and to do it faster, but also to be able to defend ourselves, to defend ourselves. But we also have to build much stronger partnerships. And of course, Moldova is, is a great example of this, but also when it comes to the Global South, uh, because we focus on Ukraine, that is extremely important, but at the same time, I mean, what is going on in Africa? What's going on in the Sahel region? Um, and uh, if we are not able, as European countries, to build strong alliances in Asia, of course, transatlantic is where it, it, it starts and where it begins and where it ends, I totally agree. But if we are not able to build strong alliances with India, with our partners in, in Asia, as you said, Jens, in Africa, in other places of the world, we will lose, I think, the global war on values. So we have to do a lot of things at the same time, and we have to, I think, be aware that all the crises we are facing are interfering with each other. So, uh, of course, being able to help Ukraine, and we have to win this one, they will never be able to win it on their own. We have to win it with them. Um, we have to build a stronger European Union. We have to build stronger partnerships with our neighbors, but we have to be much more active on the global scene at the same time. That's an extraordinary to-do list. I think one of my favorite quotes um, from you uh, right after the full-scale invasion was historic times call for historical decisions. And I think that's what you're talking about. We, this is what we've talked about, historical decisions about Finland joining NATO, historical decisions about joining the Euro-Atlantic community fully, historic decisions about defense spending. Uh, Prime Minister, uh, if I can ask you and, and take the liberty also of having President Ninistu here, the Kingdom of Denmark plays an extraordinary role geographically because of its position in the North Atlantic. And the Kingdom of Denmark has been very forward-leaning on uh, an Arctic strategy, understanding Russia's Arctic uh, militarization and what that means. I know this is something that the Secretary General often repeats, which we're very grateful for. Of course, Finland's uh, join and Sweden joining NATO has now the Arctic Council, at least the Arctic Seven, will now all be NATO members. Help us think in your own work with the Greenlanders where you see this as, as far as building the alliance, how we build greater deterrence in the north, and how do we think about the high north looking forward? Yeah, thank you for, for bringing up the high north. Uh, I think it will be... Um, uh, for, for the next many years, we will have, we, we are in the need of having more discussions about the high north. So uh, we were talking about the hybrid situation. Um, let's not forget about terrorism. Uh, the global situation when it comes to terrorism, it should still be on uh, our common table. Um, but uh, I, my guess is that we will see a more fragile situation in the high north as well. Uh, we are seeing more and more Russian activities. And of course, because of climate change, the High North will change in many different aspects. So uh, we need more awareness and we need to, to be physically uh, much more in the High North. Uh, so um, you are right, <laughs> the to-do list <laughs> is quite long and I have now made it even longer. Uh, but that's how it is to be a leader in these years. I mean, uh, uh, so, so thank you for, for, for putting the high north. And of course, um, Finland and, and Sweden being NATO members, hopefully soon, will also uh, be very important when, when it comes to the Arctic uh, region. And it is becoming more and more fragile as well. 
Absolutely. President Nister, you want to come in? Yes, I see two elements. First, uh, the security point of view. I fully agree with the Met what he, she said. Uh, uh, actually, tradition has been that Arctic Council doesn't uh, take any opinion on security issues. And, um, well, we see at the same time that the high north the tensions are growing all the time and the interest uh, towards that is not only limited to Arctic uh, Council countries. For example, UK is uh, also strongly involved in security issues. But there's also another element that, that is uh, the environmental one. We have to keep in mind that uh, Russia covers half of the Arctic. And uh, I have often said that if we lose the Arctic because of uh, climate change, we lose the globe. <clears throat> and uh, there we have to be capable of somehow trying at least to, to cooperate or let Russians understand, put them understand that uh, the question is very crucial. Their houses are collapsing in, uh, in Tundra area where, where the, the ice is melting. So they have to realize that it's a common problem too. But um, back to security issues, uh, that is an increasing issue. And I believe that NATO is uh, taking more and more notice to that too. So it's uh, historic that we have uh, two new uh, NATO members in Arctic Council, in next Arctic Council meeting, maybe. Ex <laughs> Hope so. Exactly. So I'm going to bring the audience into this important conversation, but I'm going to ask each of you to help with a question that many in the think tank community are wrestling with, and I want a really short answer. I'm going to start with you. I'm going to work down the row. So Secretary General, I'm going to start with you. Do you feel the center of gravity in Europe is now shifted east? And if you believe that, why? Really short. Because we've had a debate that, no, it's not shifting east. Yes, it's shifting east. And then what does it mean? Has it been shifting? It depends totally what you mean by the question. Uh, what has shifted east is, 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 is NATO's presence. Also, we, we have much more uh, presence, military presence uh, exercises uh, in the east because we have seen over several years uh, uh, a more aggressive uh, Russia. And, 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 and to respond to that, especially since 2014, we have for the first time in our history deployed uh, NATO troops in the eastern part of the alliance. But of course, many of those troops come from the western part of the alliance. So this demonstrates how NATO is, 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 is together and how we support uh, each other. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we do that to, to ensure that, uh, that Russia cannot continue uh, uh, its, 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 its aggressive actions against uh, countries in Europe and, 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 and to send a very clear message to Moscow that NATO is there to protect and defend uh, uh, NATO territory, uh, every inch of NATO territory. Prime Minister, shifting east, north and east with Sweden and Finland, do you feel that sense of shift of gravity from the no, I, I agree with Jens. Of course, uh, we need to be aware of the current situation. So, so we have supported, I mean, all the decisions that has been taken when it comes to the eastern flank. And uh, probably we, we will have to stay there for a, a period of, of, of time. Um, but I think what is <coughs> so important about NATO is that um, NATO is flexible in its way of thinking, in our way of thinking. Um, so, of course, now uh, the situation is about Ukraine and, uh, unfortunately, maybe also other neighboring countries. But at the same time, we are able to work with uh, the cyber hybrid uh, situation. Um, and as I said before, I think we need more focus in the south uh, because of, of the very, very uh, difficult situation, especially in Sahel uh, region. But. Um, I think the most important thing is that we are uh, flexible in our way of thinking and we are able uh, as NATO to move very fast when something occurs in, in front of us. President Sandu, do you feel that shift to the east? I do believe that because of this war, my country is now already part of Europe's security belt. Uh, we have been helping with the refugees, with the solidarity lanes, and we are trying to become a provider of security. We need help 
to become a more serious provider of security uh, for the region. President Nisti? Well, uh, I think it's quite natural that we are now <coughs> a bit uh, eastwards because of the Ukrainian war. Uh, but uh, I would also point out a certain kind of flexibility. Uh, surely we have to be prepared to react wherever there's a problem. And uh, north, yes, Arctic area, Russian border, yes, Black Sea, maybe even uh, Mediterranean. So uh, to be ready to react to whatever, that's the lesson, I guess, we have uh, got during the past year. So the answer to the think tanks is the center of gravity is flexibility and being where we need to be. Yeah. All right, we have some great questions coming forward. And let me turn the microphone here, right down the front with Alexei. Please introduce yourself and direct your question to the panelists. Thank you very much. My name is Oleksiy Goncharenko, a member of Ukrainian Parliament. And uh, the topic of this panel is building the alliance, right? And I think the building of the alliance will be always incomplete without Ukraine, Moldova, Georgia. So I have two questions from this. First to Secretary General Stoltenberg. Uh, this year NATO summit in Vilnius, will there be a strong and clear signal that Ukraine will be a member of NATO, maybe by providing membership action plan or just by statement, but clear and strong that NATO is waiting Ukraine. And the second question is to President Sandu. Uh, maybe it's the time for Moldova to revise the policy of neutrality. I understand that it's not just your decision, but I'm very much interested in what you personally think about it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Secretary General. So NATO's position on uh, membership for Ukraine is unchanged. Uh, we uh, agreed back in 2008 that uh, Ukraine will become a member of the alliance, and that is uh, still our position. Then, of course, what matters now is to ensure that Ukraine prevails as a sovereign independent state, because without having Ukraine as a sovereign independent state, there's no way to discuss any kind of relationship between NATO and Ukraine uh, in the future. So the urgent need is to provide military support, as NATO allies and partners are doing every uh, day. Uh, in, in that context, I also welcome the, the, the initiative from Prime Minister Sunak to actually have a discussion about um, the framework we need uh, to ensure an, uh, uh, an enduring peace after this war ends. Uh, because when the war ends, we need to make sure that uh, history doesn't repeat itself, that Russia doesn't uh, continue to invade Ukraine. Because this is a pattern. It started in, 20, in 2008 with the invasion of, uh, of Georgia, and then in 2014, uh, Crimea and Donbass, and then in, in uh, last year, the full-fledged invasion of uh, Ukraine. And we cannot allow Russia to uh, continue to chip away uh, European security, and we need to break uh, the circle of Russian aggression against uh, European countries. And, and therefore, we need, uh, when uh, uh, this war ends to uh, establish some kind of framework that uh, ensures that Russia's aggression doesn't uh, continue. President Sandu. Yes. Um, looking at what Russia does to Ukraine today, it's clear that neutrality cannot defend us. Neutrality can defend only when the other countries respect it. But you know that today there is no popular support, enough uh, popular support uh, to change that. And, and we know that, we understand that, and uh, we acknowledge the situation. We can discuss why is that, and I think the Russian propaganda is to a big extent uh, to be blamed for that. Uh, for instance, today the, one of the lines of the Russian propaganda is that neutrality means that the country should not strengthen its defense sector, which doesn't make any sense. But unfortunately, there are many people in Moldova who are scared of the war, and they uh, buy this kind of propaganda. So that's why I thought that we need to, to work together to um, uh, deal with this, to counter this propaganda. But Given the situation, as I said, there is no question now about changing the neutrality, but definitely Moldova should be helped to strengthen its uh, defense sector, and Moldova should be part of the new European security ar architecture. Thank you so much. I see back, back there Tobias Elwood, if we can have a microphone right there, if you can follow my finger. 
And this will be the last question because I have one closing question for this panel. Tobias. Uh, thank you very much indeed. Uh, Secretary General, I think you summed up the situation by saying Putin uh, enjoys using force and gets away with it. And if we don't stand up to Putin, then he exploits our weakness. You've heard on the stage the president of Moldova. It almost feels like we're going through this all again after Ukraine. Could I ask what more we could do internationally to support Moldova? Because that could very much be next. I was one of the first people, indeed, at this conference last year to say that NATO countries or the Joint Expeditionary Force should be sending uh, forces to Ukraine to prevent Russia's invasion. But we blinked. We were spooked by Russia's rhetoric. So my question is here. You've heard from the Prime Minister of Denmark as well, stating the difficulties that Moldova is now facing. Yes, of course, we need to pressurize and support Ukraine. But Moldova clearly could be next. What more can we do internationally? What more can NATO do? What more can the Joint Expeditionary Force do to support Moldova now before it's too late? <clears throat> Prime Minister Ferguson, I, I want to turn that question to you as you were thinking. What can we do? And then Secretary General, if you have some thoughts on that as well. No. Should I start? No. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think uh, Jens can answer when it comes to what we can do in, in the NATO frame, but I would like to add what we can do politically. Because what you said is very important that you have a, a, big, a big minority of your population that actually supports Russia because of fake news and, 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 and the war Russia is, is into when it comes to, to the medias and, and so on. And, we can only, as leaders, we can only support Ukraine and Moldova if we have the support of our populations. Because we are democracies. And when we are delivering, like Denmark, our whole artillery to Ukraine, it demands support from our populations. So I think fighting inflation, working with Moldova when it comes to energy, you are not producing any energy on your own. And I think you told me that the prices of gas has been seven doubled, seven doubled in a very, very poor European country. So, I mean, if you are an ordinary family in Moldova facing that your bills have been seven doubled, you could maybe feel then it would be better to have Russia to help us or to be a part of our daily life. So, I mean, bringing economic development into our partner countries, and never to forget the Global South. I, I, I really want, wanted this perspective because, I mean, the food crisis and the energy crisis is working against us when it comes to the situation in, in Ukraine. So, of course, there's something we can do when it comes to protect Moldova, but at the same time, we need to help to develop Moldova to, to, to make sure that the population supports the European perspective, both when it comes to NATO and when it comes to the European Union. I think this is at least as important as the hard um, measures that I guess Jens will, will talk about as well. So first of all, I agree uh, fully with uh, Meta. Uh, we, we need to provide support and different types of support to Moldova as soon as possible. Uh, uh, Georgia and uh, Ukraine, uh, two other countries which are uh, vulnerable for uh, Russian aggression as they experience Russian aggression, they aspire for NATO membership. Uh, Moldova has not uh, made a decision to aspire for NATO membership, and of course we uh, totally respect uh, that. Uh, but I think if there's any uh, lesson uh, or an additional lesson to be learned from the, uh, the, the war in Ukraine is that we need to support uh, countries which are vulnerable for Russian aggression uh, uh, as fast and as soon as possible now. Uh, because the reality is that the, um, the main reason why uh, Ukraine has been able to, uh, to repel and, 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 and to push back the Russian forces is, of course, the bravery, the courage of the Ukrainian armed forces, uh, the political leadership, the people of Ukraine. But one uh, important element has also been the fact that NATO allies actually trained and helped Ukraine since 2014. 
um, the United Kingdom, uh, the United States, Canada, and others uh, provided uh, significant training and capacity building and also equipment uh, from 2014, meaning that the Ukrainian army much, were much stronger, better equipped, better tra trained, better led uh, uh, last year than they were in 2014, and that's at least part of the explanation why they were able to withstand the Russian invasion uh, uh, now uh, uh, in a way they, didn't, uh, they were not able to do in 2014. So we are working on our partnership. We agreed at the NATO uh, summit to step up uh, the partnership and support for uh, Ukraine. But I urge NATO allies to do more uh, because it is an urgent need uh, to support those partners uh, who are vulnerable uh, for Russian uh, aggression. Secretary General, thank you so much. This has been a, such an important conversation about making sure that Finland and Sweden, full members in NATO, more support for Moldova, 100%. And I think Tobias's words are, are absolutely clear. The to-do list is massive, but historical times require historical decisions. My last one-second question to you, Secretary General. American presidents have a tradition of writing a letter to their successor with their words of wisdom. At some point, we're going to choose your successor. What words of wisdom in 30 seconds would you give your successor? So keep Europe and North America together. Uh, and I don't believe in uh, Europe alone. I don't believe in uh, North America alone. I believe in North America and Europe together, and that's NATO. Amen. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, the main program will continue momentarily. Please remain seated. We kindly ask everyone to remain seated so we can continue with the main program in just a minute. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Yeah, and now there will be one of the most anticipated items on the agenda, the US in the world, with Kamala Harris, Vice President of the United States of America. The stage is being set for this. This might take a couple of minutes, so just stay with us and you shall be rewarded. You're watching BR24 Live on this year's Munich Security Conference. gentlemen, we kindly ask you to take your seats now so we can continue with the program. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not sitting, we kindly ask you to take your seats now so we can continue with the program. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, we kindly ask you to take your seats now so we can continue with the program. Please take your seats.
Ladies and gentlemen, the session will continue in a moment. Please remain seated as the preparations go on. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. The session will continue in a moment, and we need you to be on your seats. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will continue in a moment. Please remain seated so we can continue with the program. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The session will start in an instant. We won't continue with the program until you sit down, so please take your seats now.
Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated or take your seats now so we can continue with the program. Ladies and gentlemen, the session will begin momentarily, and so you will need to sit down, otherwise this won't get going.
Ladies and gentlemen, we're about to begin. Please take your seats now. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the chairman of the Munich Security Conference, Ambassador Christoph Heusken. Excellencies, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's now my pleasure and honor to welcome the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. We are continuing our tradition that the U.S. is represented at the Munich Security Conference by the Vice President, something that President Biden started in 2009, and we are very happy that you continue this. We have a fantastic transatlantic um, delegation here. The only difference, Mr. Vice President, is when we started 59 years ago, there were only men, and now there is a woman Vice President. Welcome, Vice President. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you. Well, it is my honor to be back at the Munich Security Conference. As many of us remember, last year on this stage, I warned of the imminent invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And let us all recall, many at the time wondered how we would all respond. Many wondered, could Russia be stopped? Would NATO come together? Would NATO break apart? And would Ukraine be prepared? Colleagues, today, a year later, we know Kyiv is still standing. Russia <laughs> Russia is weakened. The transatlantic alliance is stronger than ever. And most importantly, the spirit of the Ukrainian people endures. And under Joe Biden, President of the United States, our country has demonstrated decisive leadership. As President Biden often says, the United States will support Ukraine for as long as it takes. We will not waver. And today, at this Munich Security Conference, I will then describe 
what we all continue to have at stake. The moral interest, the strategic interest, and the reason Ukraine matters for the people of America, for the people of Europe, and for people around the world. First, from the starting days of this unprovoked war, we have witnessed Russian forces engage in horrendous atrocities and war crimes. Their actions are an assault on our common values, an attack on our common humanity. And let us be clear, Russian forces have pursued a widespread and systemic attack against a civilian population. Gruesome acts of murder, torture, rape, and deportation. Execution-style killings, beatings, and electrocution. Russian authorities have forcibly deported hundreds of thousands of people from Ukraine to Russia, including children. They have cruelly separated children from their families. And we've all seen the images of the theater in Maripol, where hundreds of people were killed. Think of the image of the pregnant mother who was killed following a strike at a maternity hospital where she was preparing to give birth. Think of the images of Busha, civilians shot in cold blood, their bodies left in the street, the jarring photograph of the man who was riding his bike. Think of the four-year-old girl who the United Nations recently reported was sexually assaulted by a Russian soldier. A four-year-old child. Barbaric and inhumane. Long before I was Vice President of the United States, I spent the majority of my career as a prosecutor, beginning as a young lawyer in the courtroom and later running the California Department of Justice. I know firsthand the importance of gathering facts and holding them up against the law. In the case of Russia's actions in Ukraine. We have examined the evidence. We know the legal standards. And there is no doubt these are crimes against humanity. The United States has formally determined that Russia has committed crimes against humanity. And I say to all those who have perpetrated these crimes and to their superiors who are complicit in these crimes, you will be held to account. In the face of these indisputable facts, to all of us here in Munich, let us renew our commitment to accountability. Let us renew our commitment to the rule of law. 
As for the United States, we will continue to support the judicial process in Ukraine and international investigations because justice must be served. Let us all agree, on behalf of all the victims, both known and unknown, justice must be served. Such is our moral interest. We also have a significant strategic interest. The fight in Ukraine has far-reaching global ramifications. No nation is safe in a world where one country can violate the sovereignty and territorial integrity of another. Where crimes against humanity are committed with impunity, where a country with imperialist ambitions can go unchecked. Our response to the Russian invasion is a demonstration of our collective commitment to uphold international rules and norms. Rules and norms which, since the end of World War II, have provided unprecedented security and prosperity, not only for the American people, not only for the people of Europe, but people around the world. Principles that state that sovereign nations have a right to peacefully exist, that borders must not be changed by force, that there are inalienable human rights which governments must respect, and that the rule of law must be preserved. Indeed, this moment has tested our willingness to defend and uphold these rules and norms. And we have remained strong, and we must stay strong. Because if Putin were to succeed with his attack on these fundamental principles, other nations could feel emboldened to follow his violent example. Other authoritarian powers could seek to bend the world to their will through coercion, disinformation, and even brute force. The international order upon which we all rely could be at risk. So in the interest of global security and prosperity, one of our defining missions is to uphold international rules-based order. And nations around the world agree. Consider more than 140 countries voted at the United Nations to condemn Russia's aggression and to support Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity in defense of the core principles of the UN Charter. Of course, we have also seen nations like North Korea and Iran send weapons in support of Russia's brutal war. We are also troubled that Beijing has deepened its relationship with Moscow since the war began. Looking ahead, any steps by China to provide lethal support to Russia would only reward aggression, continue the killing, and further undermine a rules-based order. Again, the United States 
will continue to strongly support Ukraine. And we will do so for as long as it takes. The American people, you see, are in awe of the resolve of the people of Ukraine, in awe of their resilience and righteousness, their willingness to fight for freedom and liberty, and the extraordinary tenacity and leadership of President Zelensky. In fact, joining me in Munich are distinguished members of the United States Congress, Republicans and Democrats, members of the House of Representatives and the United States Senate. And they are here together because they understand the stakes. The leadership of these members has been vital to America's support of Ukraine. And President Biden and I know that their support for Ukraine will continue. We also know Ukraine will continue to be supported by a united transatlantic community. So Putin thought he could divide NATO. Remember where we were a year ago. In this, he has failed. The NATO alliance is stronger now than ever before. And the United States' commitment to NATO and to its Article 5 is ironclad. Just look at our track record over the past year. Just look at our multilateral cooperation. Together, we have provided historic assistance to Ukraine. Together, we have dealt Russia a strategic failure. Together, we have imposed unprecedented costs on Russia. And together, we have pursued energy security and reinvested in our collective defense. And we have come together to stand for our common values and our common interests and our common humanity. I have no doubt that this unity will endure. I also have no illusions about the path forward. There will be more dark days in Ukraine. The daily agony of war will persist. The global ripple effects will continue to be felt by countries near and far from Africa to Southeast Asia to the Caribbean. But if Putin thinks he can wait us out, he is badly mistaken. Time is not on his side. To be sure, Ukrainians will continue to be tried and tested, just as they have been over this past year. Transatlantic unity will continue to be tried and tested. And I am certain that Ukraine will rise to the task, that the United States and Europe will rise to the task. So my last point, America will continue our leadership in defense of human dignity in defense of rules and norms, and in defense of freedom and liberty. There is too much at stake to do anything less. Americans know well the meaning of independence. We believe in the fundamental importance of sovereignty and rule of law. And we will always stand on the side of justice. Colleagues, I do believe we all know when future generations 
look back at this moment, they will see that we understood the task before us and rose to this occasion. And so to you I say, the United States of America is proud to be your partner in this noble pursuit. Thank you. Madam Vice President, thank you for this very, very strong speech, this commitment to transatlantic unity, this commitment to the support of, of Ukraine. And we have many, many representatives from Ukraine here in the room, and they certainly were reassured by what you have said. Let me ask you, um, you confirmed this U.S. support, but we all know um, Next year, the United States will enter into an election campaign. Um, we are in a democracy. Um, we know which side of the aisle um, the result will be. Um, how sure are you that, how certain are you that what you have said that um, Putin, who wants to wait us out, that in the end he will not succeed? Thank you, Christoph. Uh, as I said, I believe, and I believe the American people, understand the stakes. And the stakes being our moral interest and our strategic interest. Uh, I will tell you, I travel around the United States, and I have seen the Ukrainian flag fly in places most of you have probably never heard of in the United States and storefronts, in front of homes, people proudly wearing, Americans proudly wearing the colors of Ukraine. The American people are aware of the images of Busha. The American people take great pride in a fight for independence, that being part of the foundation of our nation and, and our principles and values. I think about where the United States is going on this issue based on the track record of where we've been. You only have to look at where we were a year ago and where we are today in terms of the contributions and resources that America has put into everything from ammunition to artillery to air defense, from stingers to, to Abram tanks, uh, high Mars, javelins. I look at it in the context of the United States Congress, which is here in force. Um, I'm told it is the largest delegation, bipartisan and bicameral, of the United States Congress to this meeting to this Munich Security Conference. And how forward the United States Congress, in a bipartisan way, has been in terms of the track record of our support just over the last year, not to mention in a, it's a technical term called an omnibus in our budgetary processes, but at the end of last year, dedicating another $45 billion for this upcoming year to support Ukraine. Our priority is to ensure Ukraine's strength on the battlefield. And that is our commitment. And it is a commitment not only to the people of Ukraine, but it is a commitment to our values and the principles we hold dear as a nation. And I, I cannot be here without also mentioning the importance of the alliance. Europe and what it has done. Our host, Germany. I was with Chancellor Schultz yesterday. 
what we collectively have done. We are not only joined, I think, by our values and our understanding of the stakes and what is at, at stake in terms of a moral and a strategic interest, we have been great colleagues in terms of pooling our resources, coordinating our resources in a way that I believe will give Ukraine um, the best support they need to fight this fight. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for this. And for the outsiders, it is indeed the impression that this relationship, this transatlantic relationship, the relationship also between European, the German government and the US administration is as strong as ever. And thank you very much for, for this. Um, if I may, nevertheless, there is something called IRA. Yes, and, the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. <laughs> and um, it has uh, raised a lot of concern on this side um, of the Atlantic. Um, but we have been reminded also by members of Congress about CBAM on our side. Yeah. Um, how do we prevent transatlantic rifts on very important questions? Business trade issues are very important. How confident are you that these differences can be overcome and don't disturb this wonderful but absolutely necessary close transatlantic relationship. I'm very happy that you chose to raise this topic. So let me start with uh, the spirit and the intent behind the Inflation Reduction Act. Um, one very important um, area of focus for us has been to address and take our responsibility for what we must do in terms of the climate crisis, which of course is global in nature. And so, and in fact, our friends in Europe have been asking for years that we would actually step up and do more. So under Pre President Biden's leadership, we are proud that, that, that the United States has invested an historic amount in what we must do to take on our role of responsibility in the climate crisis. And by that, I mean we have, with the support of, of Congress, dedicated $370 billion to this effort. When I think of the impact on our friends and the uh, interconnection and interdependence, if you will, between whatever we do in each of, or any of our nations and the effect on the others, we think of this investment as having a global impact in, in predominantly two ways. One, the United States, I'd say this sadly, is one of the biggest emitters in the world. And we need to reduce our emissions, not only for the sake of the health and well-being of the people of our own country, but as we know, the people of the world are impacted. So this is an, a, an historic and, and very significant investment to actually turn the tide on that. And as you know, as, as many of our European friends and, and others around the globe have done, we have set strict standards for ourselves based on timelines. So there is that, which is the goal of reducing emissions. The other piece of it is we are very excited about thinking about the investment that we are making to spur innovation. We are entering a moment where we are creating a new economy, a clean energy economy. And it, if you think of us as being an investor, if you will, in creating incentives for the private sector, for, for scientists and academics to research, develop, and innovate around a clean energy economy, this investment that we are making will do that and have global impact. So that is how we think of it. But to your point, there are also issues that we need to address and do that in close consultation with our friends around the world. We have created a task force, the United States EU task force, closely coordinating and in consultation around working out some of the specific concerns. And those conversations are continuing. I met with President Macron yesterday and Chancellor Schultz. And I think we are seeing some progress there and the work will continue. No, thank you for this reaffirmation because we don't need this quarrels at, at that time. Um, if time allows, um, one last question, if I may. This Munich Security Conference um, is, of course, dedicated to Ukraine, to the support of Ukraine, to confirm the transatlantic alliance, but we have widened the participation this year. We have invited a record number of representatives from the so-called Global South. 
because um, while we have this unity between us, when you talk to representatives of the Global South, and we had them on the podium this morning, you see that many countries sit on the fence. They, they see this as kind of a continuation of the conflict between um, US and Russia or NATO and uh, EU and uh, or European countries and, uh, um, and Russia. And uh, they feel um, the consequences and they want to get it over with. They have um, an uh, equidistant position there. And uh, while we had, um, and you pointed to the 141 votes, um, but when you talk to important partners in the Global South, said they, they, are, they abstain, they um, you know, say, get it over with, we don't want to take, um, take uh, one side. And um, the point we're making, of course, is this is not East-West, this is about the rule space, internal, the rule of law that you mentioned, but we have to do some convincing because our track record is also not the best. So, what can we do also together to win over those countries that continue to sit on the fence? Well, we have to treat them as partners. And um, you and I talked about this briefly as we were walking in, and, and I thanked you and I will thank you in front of the friends for, for bringing this issue to the stage and making it a part of the agenda for this conference. I agree it is an important subject. And, I have met with many African leaders, um, leaders in the Caribbean, uh, CARICOM in Southeast Asia. And what I believe is that they are right to want to make sure their voices are heard on every level on this topic, including the impact to their nations. Uh, you look at, for example, African nations and what the, Russia's aggression in Ukraine has meant in terms of food insecurity, energy insecurity. And these are nations, as we know, that are great importers of food and energy. So when the supply decreases, it has a significant impact on their nations. So I think it is important for us to recognize the impact that Russia's war has had on these nations. I think of it in the context of uh, what we must do to also, on the previous discussion, consider the impact to the climate crisis, of the climate crisis on those nations. We are some of the biggest emitters, and the impacts are clear. I meet with CARICOM nations, so island nations in the Caribbean, and they tell me about how they're seeing land erosion, how they are seeing through, uh, through the extreme climate occurrences, a reduction in tourism and what that means in terms of a depletion of their GDP. And so these are issues that we must keep in mind when we, uh, when we have this discussion with them as partners around what the solutions look like, including standing in a unified way on these principles of sovereignty and uh, territorial integrity. Uh, my friend, the president of Ghana, I believe, spoke yesterday, and I think he captured it well when, I'm going to paraphrase, but my understanding is he said that we need to dispense with this paradigm that is about us versus them and think differently about the relationship that we have. And um, for all of those reasons, I thank you for raising this, and I think it is worthy of the type of elevation and the discussion that you are giving it. Thank you. Thank you very much for this, and this will remain a theme here. We'll discuss this also next year, and uh, maybe, um, Madam Vice President, can we already book a hotel room so you come back next year? <laughs> thank you for being here. Thank Please, you. a hand of applause. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will continue in a moment. Yeah, that has been um, the Vice President of the United States, Kamala Harris. We will talk about this in depth in just an instant, but now we travel from the United States across the ocean to the United Kingdom. Coming up next, Rishi Sunak, Prime Minister of the United Kingdom. You're watching BF24 Live. Just stay with us. Is 
Leave the room or remain seated. The program will begin in a moment. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. Ladies and gentlemen, the program will continue in the instance of a moment. Please leave the room or remain seated. Ladies and gentlemen, please remain seated. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, we'll continue with the program in a moment. Please remain seated or leave the room. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the European correspondent for Bloomberg, Maria Tedio. Just take a seat. Should I go? Okay, so if we could now just take a seat. The session is uh, about to start and I'm about to bring in the Prime Minister of the UK. If we could just sit for a second, that would be great. Okay, well, thank you so much. And now on the main stage of the Munich Security Conference, the Prime Minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak. Prime Minister. The United Kingdom will always be on the side of freedom, democracy, and the rule of law. And the security of our European continent will always be our overriding priority. Now, there's no greater example of those commitments than our response to the war in Ukraine. Just this year, we became the first country in the world to provide tanks to Ukraine and the first to train pilots and Marines. We gave £2.3 billion last year, and we will match or exceed that in 2023. Now, other allies can tell a similar story, and our collective efforts are making a difference. 
But with every day that passes, Russian forces inflict yet more pain and suffering. Now, the only way to change that is for Ukraine to win. So, we need a military strategy for Ukraine to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield, to win the war, and a political strategy to win the peace. To win the war, Ukraine needs more artillery, armoured vehicles and air defence. So now is the moment to double down on our military support. When Putin started this war, he gambled that our resolve would falter. Even now, he is betting that we will lose our nerve. But we proved him wrong then, and we will prove him wrong now. Together, we're delivering as much equipment in the next few months as in the whole of 2022. And together, we must help Ukraine to shield its cities from Russian bombs and Iranian drones. And that's why the United Kingdom will be the first country to provide Ukraine with longer-range weapons. And it's why we're working with our allies to give Ukraine the most advanced air defence systems and build the air force they need to defend their nation. Now, of course, the United Kingdom stands ready to help any country provide planes that Ukraine can use today. But we must also train Ukrainian pilots to use the most advanced jets. And that's exactly what Britain is doing so that Ukraine has the capability to defend its security for the long term. But to win the peace, we also need to rebuild the international order on which our collective security depends. First, that means upholding international law. The whole world must hold Russia to account. We must see justice through the ICC for their sickening war crimes committed whether in Bucha, Irpin, Mariupol or beyond. And Russia must also be held to account for the terrible destruction it has inflicted. We are hosting the Ukraine Recovery Conference in London this June, and we should consider together how to ensure that Russia pays towards that reconstruction. Now, second, the treaties and agreements of the post-Cold War era have failed Ukraine. So we need a new framework for its long-term security. From human rights to reckless nuclear threats, from Georgia to Moldova, Russia has committed violation after violation against countries outside the collective security of NATO. And the international community's response has not been strong enough. As Jens Stoltenberg has said, Ukraine will become a member of NATO. But until that happens, we need to do more to bolster Ukraine's long-term security. We must give them the advanced NATO standard capabilities that they need for the future. And we must demonstrate that we'll remain by their side, willing and able to help them defend their country again and again. Ukraine needs and deserves assurances of that support. So ahead of the NATO summit in Vilnius, we will bring together our friends and allies to begin building those long-term assurances. And our aim should be to forge a new charter in Vilnius to help protect Ukraine from future Russian aggression. Now let me conclude with one final thought. What's at stake in this war is even greater than the security and sovereignty of one nation. It's about the security and sovereignty of every nation. Because Russia's invasion, its abhorrent war crimes and irresponsible nuclear rhetoric are symptomatic of a broader threat to everything we believe in. From the skies over North America to the suffering on the streets of Tehran, some would destabilize the order that has preserved peace and stability for 80 years. They must not prevail, and we need not be daunted. As President Zelensky said when he addressed the UK Parliament last week, we are marching towards the most important victory 
of our lifetime. It will be a victory over the very idea of war. And we could have no greater purpose than to prove him right. Thank you. Prime Minister, thank you. Uh, your speech, I thought, was very clear. Basically, Ukraine has to win the war and Russia loses. But you said something I want to pick up on and elaborate. You talk about NATO assurances for Ukraine. What does that mean specifically, and when do you do them? Do you do them while the war is still ongoing? And don't you fear that Russia will say, ultimately, we're right. We don't fight Ukraine. We fight NATO. Well, uh, Marin, nice to see you. I think, first of all, it's, it's clear that the security guarantees, the architecture that was in place, before this war has failed Ukraine. Right? That's just a statement of fact. Uh, Ukraine had received assurances when it gave weapons up. Russia has continually violated, whether it's human rights treaties or indeed arms control treaties. So what happened before has not worked. So we should be clear about that. And now our job is to look forward and say, what's the right thing going forward? Now, as I mentioned, Jens Stoltenberg has said, NATO, you know, well, Ukraine will be a member of NATO. But between now and then, what I think we need to work on are providing Ukraine with the means to win the war right now. And that means very specifically artillery, long-range weapons, armored vehicles, air defense. That's the most critical thing. What we can also do is make sure that we're training Ukraine on NATO standard equipment. That's what we're doing when it comes to aircraft with their pilots. Uh, but I think what we do need to do is think about the future of how we protect Ukraine's security. And we need to have that conversation with our allies and talk about the longer-term provision of supporting Ukraine. And that's the conversation that I think we should start having because the Vilnius summit is a good place to conclude that. So this year, so the assurances would come this year. I wonder, there has been a lot of debate. You talked about the fighter jets. Uh, there has been a lot of debate here about the ammunition, the risk that they may not have enough ammunition, but also the long-range missiles. There's concern that perhaps Perhaps one of the targets would be Crimea. Under your watch as UK Prime Minister, would you approve of long-range missiles that could hit Crimea? I think, I think the most important thing here to recognize is, it actually starts with NATO. What is NATO? NATO is a defensive alliance. Mm -hmm. right? That's the first thing to recall. What is Ukraine doing? Ukraine is trying to defend itself. Mm -hmm. right? It is suffering unprovoked aggression. Its territorial integrity, its sovereignty has been violated. Its people are being killed. And it has every right to defend itself. And that's what we should be doing. And that's the support that we collectively in this room are, are providing. And critically, there are things that Ukraine needs to gain that decisive advantage on the battlefield. That's why the provision of heavy tanks was so important. That's why air defense is absolutely critical. You're right to mention artillery. And longer range weapons also help. Uh, now, those are all the things that will allow Ukraine to defend itself and repel Russian aggression. And indeed, yes to have a counter-offensive that moves Russia outside of its own country. I think that's entirely reasonable, and we should be fully behind Ukraine in that ambition and want that ambition to succeed. And for them, the entire country means Crimea, as you know uh, very well. Uh, I, in your speech, there was a lot of bravado in the sense of Ukraine has to win the war and Russia has to be proven wrong. Vladimir Putin has to lose uh, this war. Some would say, and you make it clear, you still believe the UK is a big geopolitical agent. Zelensky obviously went to London. He sees value in the UK, but some here would believe to really be the strong geopolitical agent, you need to solve the pending issues that you have with the EU. I know you probably know this question is coming. There's a frenzy of reports that you do have a deal over the Northern Irish Protocol that could come Monday, potentially. Do you have a deal? Does it come Monday? And I wonder beyond that, does it reflect your wish that you want to have a normal working relationship with your European allies? So Lots of things in there to, to unpack. I think that the first thing to say, when it comes to the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol, there are real issues that need resolving. The way that the protocol has been implemented, it's causing very real challenges for families, for people, for businesses on the ground. Very practical difficulties, and they need to be resolved. But that also there's an issue of the democratic deficit that sits at the heart of the protocol as it's currently constructed. Now, those are the things that we need to resolve. And I'm working very hard together with my ministerial colleagues, foreign secretaries in the audience, Secretary of State for Northern Ireland. You know, we are working very closely together. We're engaging in those conversations with the European Union. Next week, but, uh, potentially? All the time, and we have been for a while. But what I'd say is there is still work to do. 
I think uh, there is still work to do. There are still challenges to work through. We have not resolved all these issues. No, there, is no, there isn't a deal that has been done. There, there is an understanding of what needs to be done. It's the issues that I outlined. And James was in, in Brussels yesterday. I've been in Northern Ireland talking to parties there about the things that we need to fix. Uh, we're working through those. We're working through them hard. And we will work through them intensely with the EU. But we are by no means done. There is no deal that is done. There, there's work to do. And that's what we will set about doing. So I guess you basically say on Monday that's, that's not a deadline in, in any way in your view. But I wonder, on a bigger picture, is there a wish to now have a normal working relationship with your European allies? Is this is a war that's happening in continental Europe. Yeah, look, of course there is. I know, you know, the UK may have left the European Union. It didn't leave Europe. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are a European nation. I talked in my speech about our commitment to European security. And look, of course we want to have a positive, constructive relationship with our European partners, neighbours, allies, individually, but also with the EU. And I think you can see that. You can see it, most importantly, in the response to Ukraine, but very specifically, actually, on sanctions, where there has been exceptionally good close working and coordination between the UK and the EU on designing and implementing sanctions packages, which only work effectively when they're done well in, in a coordinated fashion. I think we've demonstrated that we can do that together. But if I look at a couple of other areas where we're having good conversations as a result of positive, uh, um, the positive dialogue, one is illegal migration, mm -hmm. actually the Calais group of countries that is working together to tackle illegal migration met at the end of last year. That, that's a group of countries that involves the UK, very productive set of discussions that were had. It's a sign of, of good dialogue, good cooperation. Uh, and then lastly on energy security. Mm -hmm. I think all of us in Europe over the last year have re-examined where we're getting our energy from. And ultimately, you know, that, is a, that is a shared goal and one in which we work in together. We have an interconnected electricity market. How can we not work together uh, on that? And those are some of the very real practical things that we are currently engaged on. And that's, I think, that's a sign of progress and is a, a welcome and positive development. And, and perhaps in your tone, and you did come with a very big delegation, which has not been the case at times. I, the I am to I'm told that, James will correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm told that this is the, 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 the biggest delegation that we've had. And, and so it I, reflects that, a new change in tone. Absolutely. I, and I think there's this idea that was put to me earlier by someone that somehow just because we left the EU, that was, should be interpreted as the EU or the UK turning in on itself. Nothing could be further from the truth, right? Like the, the UK has always been an outward looking country, and we are committed to continuing and doubling down on that. And I think, funnily enough, I think last, it was, uh, it was relatively recently, one of our brand new aircraft carriers. Um, which we're very proud of, went around, around the world and participated in joint missions with almost every navy along the way, from Europe to the Middle East to Asia. Um, and it was an incredible sign, I think, of the UK's desire to be an outward-looking nation. How could anyone say, uh, with something like that going on, that we were somehow retreating? No, of course not. That's our aircraft carrier out in the Indo-Pacific in partnership with other countries in the region, talking about regional security uh, with them. You know, we're currently in the process of negotiating UK accession to the CPTPP. Um, so I think these are all quite tangible demonstrations of our desire to be engaged of course, in, in Europe, but also around the world, whether it comes to trade, security, energy policy, you name it. And let's see what the audience thinks, because now it's time to take a question from the audience. Oh, go ahead. Uh, well, first of all, I would like to um, commend um, the United Kingdom and you, obviously, for the leadership in providing the arms. I'm, as an officer of the Ukrainian army, benefited from um, UK weapons provided first day of the war. It saved my life and saved the life of uh, many of my friends in the army. Now um, is a question. <laughs> we hear more and more, including in this conference, that the like, depletion of stocks became a reason or excuse not to provide more weapons to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Interesting phenomenon that the countries which are bordering or closer to Russia and facing the risk more than others, they actually first want to provide weapons to Ukraine. It's not that they have more higher stocks. No, they just feel the risk and understand that they reduce this risk by supplying weapons to Ukraine. I would like to understand, can you spell out the logic why UK 
is demonstrating leadership? What is logic behind your pragmatic logic in how to make sure that others which are fall behind also adhere to the same speed that is demonstrated by the United Kingdom? Thank you. Well, first of all, sir, can, can I just say thank you to you and your colleagues for the bravery that you've shown in defending your country. It's been an inspiration to us all. And, and thank you for your kind words about, about the UK. Now, you know, my, my pitch to everyone would be simple. I think we're at an inflection point in the conflict whereby if we collectively, as the UK has tried to lead in doing, step up our support to Ukraine at this moment, right, with armoured vehicles, with longer range weapons, with air defence, with artillery, Ukraine will have the ability to gain a decisive advantage on the battlefield. Right? It, you know, it can't just be about defending. We've got to be able to provide Ukraine with the means to fight back. And that's why I think now is critical. And I talked about it in my speech. We're, we're providing more arms in the next three months than we've done in an entire year because time is of the essence. And there is a moment in this conflict where we can make a difference and help Ukraine win. And that would be my pitch to everyone and everyone that I speak to is do what we are doing, join the countries that are providing that support, intensifying it and accelerating it now, because that is how we can try and bring this conflict to an end on terms that are favourable for Ukraine to ensure that Ukraine wins. That was my very simple pitch. Um, I think the alternative is far worse. So that's what we clearly should do. We all are united in wanting Ukraine to win. And if there's an opportunity to do that sooner and take advantage of the moment we had, why would we not seize it? What are we waiting for? would be my pitch. So now's the moment to act. Now, with regard to stockpiles, I think, the, again, the pitch I would make to people is to remember, what do we have those stockpiles for? Right? If you're a European nation and you're, you have this equipment, you have to ask yourself, what was it there to defend against? Right? What was it there to do? And if one of those stockpiles is now helping to degrade a Russian tank, well, isn't that precisely what it would have been used for, you had it in your stockpile for. So I don't think you should necessarily see every bit of depletion of stockpiles as somehow a negative that is a problem. It's actually, well, hang on, that, that's what the purpose of these things were. Um, so our security, even as the stockpiles might be depleted, if they're degrading Russian armed forces, they are increasing our security at the same way. Um, so that's one way to think a little bit about the stockpiles. But it's right that we do need to replenish them in the UK, we've provided extra funding for our armed forces to ensure that they do have uh, the certainty that those stockpiles will be replenished because our own security in that sense is important. And one of my colleagues in front of you um, will hold my feet to the fire on that particular question. Um, but that's what we are doing. And I think actually, again, working together with European partners and more broadly around the world, ensuring that the supply chains can ramp up to the degree that we need them to is an important thing for us to do together. And I think as we've been doing that, one thing we've discovered is the interoperability of all our pieces of kit is probably not as strong as it should be and could be. Uh, and that is a lesson for us to take away and improve going forward. Prime Minister, you have multiple questions, but right, I see I'm a gentleman at the back. Quick answers. Well, let's <laughs> Thank you very much, Arthur Gerasimo, Ukrainian Parliament MP, uh, European Solidarity Faction. First of all, from all Ukrainian people, I want to say thank you for your country, support, for supporting Ukraine, and for your leadership. But now the key issue is time and speed of decision-making process. And UK showed the brilliant examples in this speed of decision-making. And the question is simple from one point of view, but maybe complicated from the other. Which steps, from your point of view, can be done with purpose drastically increase the speed of decision making of all NATO members while supporting Ukraine and while sanctioning Russia? Well, I, I, do you want to take another question, or do you want me to? One final one, and then we'll put them together. Yes. Let's just put them together so he can maybe, and then pass the microphone behind so we can take them off. Thank, thank you. Prime Minister, uh, thank you for impeccable leadership and, and your attitude, constant attitude on, on the leadership. Uh, Pavel Popescu from Romanian Parliament, I want to ask you specifically on the Black Sea region. The U.S. Congress passed partial legislation which will focus on that region. How important do you think is to have a Black Sea uh, 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 security strategy in the following months in order to insulate 
that area and countries like Moldova, considering the yeah. fact that we defend the longest border, NATO border, with Ukraine and yeah. the other Prime border. Minister, there's a just a very final question I want to also take, and then we combine them. Oleksii Gonchrenko, member of Ukrainian par uh, Parliament. First of all, that's my question. You know, it's F-16, and my question is when the training of our pilots will start. They said hello to you. They have a special gift for you I will give you after. <laughs> but we um, just say us when they will start, because that is uh, the prayer of Ukrainians today. Thank Thank you. Okay, perfect. Fighter jets, Moldova, uh, remain. Right. Well, look, in terms of the, the, the Baltic, I think look, one of the most pressing, look, obviously, the situation in Moldova is, uh, we're all aware of. I think actually one of the other things that has come to light about the Baltic and the sea is the. So, oh, sorry, it's about Black Sea, sorry. Was about, was about the provision of food supplies. And I think that was something that was very acute earlier this, uh, well, later last year. And, you know, part of the awful tragedy of this conflict and what Russia is doing is the food inflation that it's causing and the impact that's having on some of the poorest people in the world. And I think part of, actually, collectively, one thing we, I think, in hindsight, we needed to do a better job of explaining that to the countries affected, that the reason food prices are going up, that grain isn't available, is not because of Western sanctions, it's because Russia is bombarding grain fields, grain stores, and not letting things pass. So I think it is, it's been a great sign of international cooperation led by the UN. Turkey's played a, an important role in ensuring that the Black Sea Grain Initiative has been successful. Again, we have another date in March where that needs to be renewed. We should collectively focus our efforts on renewing it to in, ensure that the provision of grain to countries that need it continues to flow. And it's something that you know, President Zelensky is very committed to. He, he actually, in spite of the fact that he's, you know, he's busy defending his country, he also wants to make sure that Ukraine is continuing to provide food to some of the, the poorest people in the world, and that's enormously to his credit, and we need to help him do that. Um, look, on, on timing, I, I kind of just reiterate the point I made before. I think we're at an inflection point. We have a moment. And for everyone who says we want Ukraine to win and Russia must fail, if you believe that, then you must act now because now is the moment to accelerate and increase the supplies of, as I said, those four key things, longer range missile, uh, weapons, um, artillery, armored vehicles, air defense. Those are the critical needs and we need them now and that's how we're gonna turn this thing around and ensure Ukraine does win. And look, on, on fighter jets uh, and provision, as, that's what we've as an announced, announced doing. We're starting to train Ukrainian pilots on, on both NATO standard aircraft, but also in tactics. I think that's important. And that when we talk about the long-term way to increase Ukraine security, that's what we've started doing, and I think others will, will follow in time. Look, with jets, everyone knows that there are complications in the provision of particular types of aircraft, because everything that comes alongside that. But what we've said very clearly is, where other countries are able to provide aircraft immediately, the United Kingdom will happily support them in doing that. Um, and that's something that I'm very clear about. And I'll end on, on this note. You, uh, talked about uh, President Zelensky and I and, and the gift. There was a picture, I think, of the President and I when he visited the UK, where we were being flown somewhere in one of our RAF, um, in one of our RAF uh, aircraft um, with our helmets and whatnot, and someone uh, had posted it uh, with the caption that said, the next Top Gun movie looks a bit crap. Uh, <laughs> but his message was well made, and we'll be there to support you. Prime Minister, your team says you have to, you have to go, but I cannot let you go without asking you this question. Uh, just an hour ago, one year, the top Chinese diplomat was here, and he says, or said, China has a plan and will present a plan to bring peace, potentially, to Ukraine. Do you believe China can be a mediator in this war? Well, look, a I, sincere look, China, mediator? Look, China has to play a responsible role when it comes to situations like this, and that's what I would urge and ask them to do. And obviously, you know, uh, Chancellor Schultz, Olaf, had a conversation with them about nuclear rhetoric last year, um, which was important that we de-escalate that. It was unacceptable use of nuclear rhetoric from Russia um, that thankfully has now uh, uh, you know, dampened down. But look, when it comes to China more broadly, I've been very clear, China represents a, you know, a systemic challenge to our values and our interests. We in the UK are very alive to that and will take the steps needed to protect ourselves against that, whether it's with the power to block hostile investment, recently we did that, whether it's standing up for abuses in Hong Kong or Xinjiang. You know, we, we will do what's necessary to protect ourselves and engage with China on trying to resolve some of these pressing problems where we can. And I guess your messages do not help Russia in this war. And anyway, those companies, there will be sanctions if they do. And, that, and that's, you know, whether it's on Belarus and elsewhere, we've been very clear 
clear that Russia should be completely isolated in the global community. Well, Prime Minister, thank you so much for your time here at the Munich Security Conference. Perfect. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, the main... Two big global players in the world, the US and the UK. Let's have a closer look on that with Thorsten Teichmann, our former DC correspondent, joining us now live on the ground at the Munich Security Conference. Thorsten, thank you for being with us. And let me ask you, perfectly blunt, is the US still, or again, the leading voice in the world amid the war in Ukraine? If you want to measure it by money, definitely it's the leading voice. I think some estimates tell us that the U.S. has invested in support for military, but also humanitarian aid for Ukraine since the beginning of the war, 50 billion U.S. dollars. In comparison, uh, the German Bundeskanzler yesterday mentioned that Germany has provided so far 12 billion euros. Uh, there's a big gap between the two, and Germany is a big provider for help in Ukraine. So, yeah. America is still the leading voice here in Munich, but also in this confrontation with Russia. How torn is the U.S. between supporting Europe and facing China? I don't know how, how torn it is. It, it's, it's, it's the same. They said today, and Kamala Harris as the vice president speaking here on the Munich Security Conference, said that the commitment to Ukraine and to Europe uh, is unshakable and uh, they are in till the end because the confrontation with Russia, as she mentioned, is something that the whole world is facing. If Putin is going through with his imperial excursion and with his murder, uh, she was talking about crimes against humanity. If he's going through, then other regimes might feel emboldened to do the same and that is not possible to happen. That's what she said. At the same time, she mentioned China in her speech and she was saying that there is a line that China is not providing Russia uh, with uh, arms material, with ammunition like uh, North Korea and Iran are doing right now. And China, I think, is stressing that they are not doing. But at the same time, China became one of the most important partners for Russia since Russia invaded Ukraine. Picking up on that cue, the support is unshakable. Harris said America will continue its leadership and is proud to be Europe's partner. Will it also do so and be if the 47th president isn't a Democrat? Yeah, that was the question that was raised afterwards. Uh, I think uh, there are some uncertainties. Uh, what's happening, for example, in the re uh, fraction of the Republican Party? I mean, this big delegation that is sent from Congress here to Munich is involving Democrats and Repub Republicans alike. But the big monetary support for Ukraine is definitely an issue that could be raised in the election during the election campaign. And some Republicans have done, and they were mentioning that they are not seeing the point of supporting Ukraine in this way, as long, for example, as inflation is this high in the US and people are suffering from it in domestic terms. And so this issue might be raised if we are facing this election in 24. Let's switch to the United Kingdom. I remember at the Munich Security Conference after the Brexit, Wolfgang Ischinger, chairman at that time, he was wearing a shirt with uh, the European flag on it, but one of the stars was missing, symbolizing that um, the UK had left. So how strong is uh, UK's voice still in Europe? I think this was the question to the Prime Minister right now, and the Prime Minister tried to draw a picture where the UK is still interested in international politics, and also always mentioned by the Ukrainian side, I think after the US, the UK is one of the strongest supporters in the confrontation with Russia right now. So there is no doubt that they are still part of Europe even if they are not part of the European Union. But this question is raised again and again, and I think it was also raised in the context of the Northern Ireland Accord, and the question is never getting answered, because there are problems, there are concerns, and still there is no answer to them. I think he just could repeat what he said before, and no real solution in sight there. We've had um, Boris Johnson, we've had Partygate, we've had Liz Truss, who couldn't outlast a lettuce. Is Rishi Sunak now the right one to face the challenges of our times? 
That's what he tried to tell here, that he is uh, quite well understood the situation, is rising up to the occasion, is supporting Ukraine, and this question to the future world order, uh, as it is questions by, by Putin, and he's facing this as the European Union is, as America is, and uh, he's contributing to it. Um, I think one question was interesting from uh, UK, uh, from a parliamentarian from Ukraine. He was asking um, whether the UK is starting to train fighter pilots from Ukraine on F-16 planes. And uh, the British government said yes. This question was also raised today in a background meeting between the Ukraine uh, foreign minister and uh, senators from the US. And this is kind of tricky because when we're talking about fighter planes for the US, it was uh, for the U Ukraine, it was always mentioned that the training is so hard. And what Ukraine's officials are doing now is they're asking first for the training, and then it might be easier to answer the question about the planes. Yeah, will there be jets eventually? That is this discussion here, and I think there are different points. If you ask the German Bundeskanzler, like people did yesterday, he will uh, mention to you that even now that many countries promised tanks to the Ukraine, not everyone is filling through. So I think the question is still open and is discussed from different point of angles. It depends on the countries and their commitments. Thank you so much for your time and expertise, Thorsten Teichmann, live on the ground at the Munich Security Conference at the Hotel Bayerischer Hof in Munich. Yeah, we'll take a short break, grab some lunch, hydrate properly, and then we'll see you back at quarter after 3 p.m. with a new live stream. So this one will end now, and then we will be having a panel discussion, whole free and at peace, visions for Ukraine. You're watching BR24 live, and I'll see you in the afternoon.